Ladies and gentlemen, our referee has called a stop to this contest, declaring the winner by knockout and new MMA show. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to a new round of and new MMA show. I am the temporary host yet again. Uh, while our Mike Hansen is on paternity leave here, holding down the fort with a young child and an even younger loaf of bread. Uh, so, again, congratulations to them too. But we are here to keep the show rolling, to keep things moving. It was a big weekend of UFC fights, an even bigger weekend of fights in general. So we have a lot to get to. Let's jump right into it. Introducing my compadre... Today, Mr. Mark Prio from New York. What's going on? What's up, buddy? Back to our uh, co-hosting duties. Uh, really what's happened here is that we just did so well last week that we decided we don't need Mike for this show anymore, so we've kind of just yeah. let him go. 100%. Um, Removed him from the text story <laughs> and everything's gone. <laughs> but gone. seriously, I, we do expect Mike back next week, so we look forward to that. But uh, for this week, you are stuck with the two of us. One more time. Although there is a guest later in this show, so there will be three of us at one point. So we have that to look forward to. Yes, sir. If you guys aren't aware, there are some goodies going on that are not MMA related this weekend that are it's one of those rare bear in a year for boxing. So we're, we'll <laughs> jump into that later on. Um, all right, guys. Let us get right into the rundown here. So we are going to start, of course, first on the marquee. Uh, we'll be talking about Max Holloway's win. We'll be going through a lot of the UFC recaps uh, that happened this weekend. Jumping into our lightning round, obviously, to clear all that up. Then we will go right into our pre-o rankings, find out who rose and who fell this weekend. Uh, we'll jump into our PFL recap, and Mark will quickly take <coughs> care of that. Uh, disappointing Shane Burgos result. Uh we will jump right into the MMA sphere. We'll go really quickly with a couple of stories and then into some fight announcements. And then we will get into this upcoming weekend, which is chock full of violence and kicking and punching. Uh, first, we're going to start off with Bellator 294, Carmouche versus Bennett 2. That is going down on Friday, this Friday, uh, April 21st. Uh, and then we will go into Bellator 295, which will be immediately preceding that day on Saturday, April 22nd. Uh, that is Rafael Stotts versus Patchy Mix. Uh, then we're going to get into the UFC fight night, Pavlovich versus Blades. Uh, we're going to actually do a, a few quick picks for these guys because there are some really good fights on this card. It's a real low-key banger of a card. Uh, and then we'll get into some more detailed previews. And then we will be introducing our special guest, uh, in order to get into some more detail about the Gervonta Davis and Ryan Garcia fight, we will be welcoming in our resident boxing expert in Tommy, who is the host of the Unboxing podcast. So we'll get some more highlights from him later on. And then if one of us has trivia, we'll do trivia. <laughs> do you have trivia? I haven't thought of any, but I could. <laughs> I didn't but do any trivia. By the time we get through all the shit you just said, we may just fucking nix the tri trivia and go to sleep. So we'll see. Yeah. So we we reserve the right to nix the trivia. So that is what's not, that's what might what happen. All right. Yes. All right, man. So let's get into it. First, today <clears throat> on the marquee has got to be Max Blessed Holloway. Yet again with a beautiful unanimous decision over up-and-coming stud now probably a staple in the top uh, top 10 for sure might even be the top five for a little bit in arnold allen um mark what did you think of the performance and where does max holloway go from here what i thought is that max is still so damn good like it's almost like at this point he holds the max belt at, at featherweight like He's not the champ, but he's almost like a secondary belt in and of himself where it's like, can you beat Max Holloway at, at featherweight? Uh, and no one can uh, other than Volk. He, he gets another one. I thought he made a great statement in round one to come out the way that he did. He came out aggressive. 
connecting on some big shots. And I'm sure Arnold Allen knew that, like, Max was still here. I, I don't think he took Max lightly at all. But it was still good for Max to come out and, and set that pace right away and immediately make it crystal clear. Um, so that was good to see. Allen did bounce back in, in round two. Um, it was a close round. I remember live being torn on on who took that round. I think the judges were a little torn on it as well and ended up not not mattering in terms of the decision because Max did get three of them. Um, but Arnold fought well in, in, in round two. By the end of that round, Max kind of started taking it back, and then three and four is where he really took over the fight. Um, I could watch Max hit people all day. He, he's just... He's so damn comfortable in, in exchanges. Like, he will take one so that he can slip the next one and respond with four. Like, and they're from everywhere. It's it's a jab, then an uppercut, a body kick, an overhand, like a leg kick. It, it's everything. A body shot. It, he just, he mixes it up so well, and he countered so well all fight long here. Like, Allen would land one big one. But then Max would slip and he would land three. And it was the difference in the fight, I thought. It was the reason that he won most of these rounds. Um, again, to Allen's credit, he went for it in round five. He came out hard. He was in there exchanging to the bell. He almost got dropped real late. But he probably took that round. Uh, all the judges, I believe, did give him that round. So good for him. And it shows you how good he is. And as you said, he probably is going to be around for a while. I'm sure he learned a lot in this fight. And he was close. It was competitive, but Max was just a small notch above, uh, as he still seems to be uh, on everyone except, obviously, Alexander Volkanovsky. And uh, no one else has been able to solve it as of yet. So Max Max continues the ride as as the uh, number one ranked featherweight. It's a beautiful thing that performance. Watching Max Holloway move. And his his distance management, knowing that he's not going to get hit, knowing that he's just out of range, um, and he got cracked a few times. The real issue with Arnold Allen is the power. That power differential, I think, is a real big problem because Arnold Allen throws one hundred percent in everything that he in, that he throws with, um, and to his detriment a lot of the time. That's usually why he's breaking his goddamn hands. Is because he's throwing yeah. with everything that he has. This might be the one fight he walked away with both hands intact because he barely got anything off. I didn't hear anything. Yeah, maybe he, maybe he actually kept them okay. He barely got anything off. But the small things that he did land with, the few times he really landed on Max, even the, the, the breeze buys, you could see the damage on Max's face. Yep. Like, Arnold Allen is, is a problem, a real, real issue when it comes to that power. And I think he's going to be a real issue in the division, like I said, for, for a little bit now. Uh, it'll be nice to see some of these matchups. And yeah. segueing into the matchups, where do you think Mr. Holloway goes from here? I was actually just looking up Arnold Allen's age. I know he's young, but I was curious. 29, he's young. okay. Oh, he's um, not that young. Yeah, not quite as young as I thought. I thought it was going to be like yeah. 27. Um, yeah, Holloway. You know, he's a tough one. He's fought almost all these guys, but he, I feel, kind of made it easy because he asked for the Korean zombie. Uh, they have not fought. Zombie said, let's do it. And I'm here for it. Like, as I was kind of just saying, Holloway is at that point where he's turned almost all these guys back. He's saying that's the one guy he never got to fight, that he would love to fight. Zombie's probably going to take, what, one or two more fights here? Why not let that happen? Um, what I'd really love to see from Max is a committed move to lightweight. I just think there's so much fun up there that he could be having while in the prime of his career. Like, Max... Gaethje, Max Oliveira, Max Daryush, a Connor rematch, Chandler, physique, like I could go on and on. I would love for him to actually commit to a move like that so he can take these fights while him and all these dudes I just said are still in their primes. And we could see some of these, but I'm not sure that that's happening. I did hear him mention it again in the lead up to this fight that it's always on his mind. But, you know, fight ends. First thing he says is I'd love to fight Korean zombies. So it seems like... We're not doing it yet. I want to be clear. I hate that fight. <laughs> I hate it. I hate it so much. Um, I want Korean Zombie to stop. And the moment I heard this, him call him out, I was like, no. <laughs> no, thank you. And then Korean Zombie's like, yeah, why not? I'm like, fuck. <laughs> what are you doing, bro? Um, I mean, he's still, he's still in rankings here. I, I just can't really get on board with that. I'd rather see him fight the winner of Josh Emmett 
Ila Teporia. That would be more on my list of things I p- would prefer to see. I would really like to see Chan Sung Jung hang it up or maybe fight somebody who's kind of up and coming to make sure that like he can defend himself properly. <laughs> yeah. He's taken two real bad ass beatings at like the, the Brian Ortega one was I feel like pretty bad. And then the Volkanovsky one was one of the worst at a high level I've seen in a minute. Um, yes. Yes. So yeah, I, I, I'm not really super jazzed about it, but uh, I get it. Winner. I get it. Winner of Josh Emmett, Ila Tapur. Yeah, I think that's a good banger fight. All right. What about Arnold Allen? What do we think? We uh, where are we going to stick him now? I will say it could be one of two returning fighters. They're at a, a little bit different levels, so it depends which where you'd want to go with Arnold Allen. But I think Brian Ortega coming back could make sense, and I also think Giga Chikadze, if he is ever ready to go, could be a cool one as well. I like the Brian Ortega one. I was actually going to go in the same direction I went in the other, my last pick, but in the other direction. The loser of Josh Emmett, Ila Tapuria, I think would be interesting for Arnold yep. Allen. That works as well. All right. Anything else you want to talk about, Max Holloway, or this fight before we move right along? No, it's a good pace. Let's keep it going. It is a good pace. It's <laughs> a lot right. happening. Congratulations to Max Holloway on being on our prestigious, exclusive. You're going to do this every week now, aren't you? Every fucking week. <laughs> Congratulations on the mark. All right. Next on the list here, we have Edson Barboza completely flatlining Billy Q in the first round here. I guess I'll go first. We had Mark go first. Uh, what a beast of a performance. And I can tell you right now, I don't care what anybody says, he's practiced that. That is something he has spent hours in the gym practicing. Whether he's doing it on a person, he's doing a shadow boxing, he's doing it on a bag. I, I promise you that that is a move, a uh, move. Uh, uh, a reaction that he has worked on over and over and over again. It was so perfect. <clears throat> the timing was so disgusting. Um, and Billy Q's entry was a little sloppy. And I think it, you know, it, it left him open to a lot of damage. Even if it wasn't a knee, it could have been an uppercut. It could have been a lot of different things. Um, but his hands were wide out of place. His body was down, telegraphed the takedown completely. And, Ate a knee straight to the jaw. Um, beautiful performance from from Edson. Had me a little worried in the beginning because I didn't. I hate when he starts moving backwards all the time, and he's almost seems like he's giving up the space um, and, and ends up against the cage. And all, like that, Edson concerns me. Um, but it seems like at some point he was looking for that motion. He was looking for that move, um, and I think he he had a lot of confidence that if he landed it, he would go. So. Good on him, man. It was a great performance. So I don't know if you heard him post-fight, but he said that they had been drilling that specific instance all camp. He said it was something they saw in Quarantillo. Yeah, dude. You could tell from the way he threw it, from his reaction to it, you can tell that that was something that was second nature to him. He had probably spent hours and hours and hours drilling that. Yep. Yeah, he said they saw it. Um, But yeah, that... Went largely how I thought it would. Um, I, th- I think I said round two, so I, I, it, w- it was quicker than I thought. But as much as Edson is maybe on the, the latter part of his career here, if you're not a top-shelf wrestler who can take Edson down on command, then you have to be a really high-level striker. Like, guys who are just going to try to outscrap him on the feet are generally going to end up getting hurt, and, and that's how I saw this one. He's too good. He's too fast. He's seen it all. And if you let him play and analyze, he's going to find a spot and he's going to hurt you badly. And that's exactly what he did to Billy Q. Time to the big knee. That was all she wrote. And Billy will be back. You know, that was his first big chance, really. And he's a good fighter. But Edson gets a win that he really needed to stay relevant here. As, you know, how I said, as his career kind of moves toward the back end. But he he sets himself up now for another another probably top 10-ish, at least ranked level fight. Yeah, and you had to wonder how the pressure from Billy Q was going to play a factor in the fight, especially knowing that that's part of it's a big <clears> part of Billy Q's game. Um, but I think the sloppiness and the takedowns, I think in the end, even with the pressure, ended up costing him. So, yeah, good on 
Mr. Barboza for getting a beautiful win. Did he end up getting a knockout bonus? Do you know? I don't know. Bonus? I feel like he should have got, but I don't know. Right? Like, I give that man his fucking his 50 Gs, bro. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's see. Where does Edson Barboza go from here? So I don't think Edson really moves much, right? I mean, this wasn't nah. really one of those ones that moves him anywhere. Um, probably a gatekeeping fight if, yep. if you've ever seen one. Yep. Um, so I don't really know what you do with him. I guess there is a fight now scheduled for Bryce Mitchell. Um, that well, is remember coming he, up. Remember, he just lost to Bryce Mitchell. Well, I figured he could do the loser of that fight. Even if it's Bryce who just beat him? When did he beat him? Last fight? No, he, two, he lost or... to Elitza Portia. No, no, no. I'm saying Edson's last fight. Unless there's one in between there that I'm forgetting. Oh, no. Oh, yeah, you're right. Just this one and the Bryce Mitchell one. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh... Yeah, that was Bryce's breakthrough. Yeah, like, I, I'm so concerned about giving Edson another random kid to just figure out if he's good enough or not. You know what I mean? I'll throw something out. I feel like a dude who's kind of right in the same place as Edson right now, granted he is more of an up-and-coming type, is Sadiq Yusuf. I could see that being the logical one. But the one I'm saying I'll throw out is if they listen to you and Max versus the zombie does not happen, I actually think Edson and Chan Sung Jung is a cool fight of of kind of two veteran violence dudes. Bro. Why are you trying to kill this fucking poor guy? He's going to take a fight. Would you just not want him to fight anybody? Nobody. Not a single human being do I want Chan Sung Jung. We're past that dude. With. He's not retiring. He's fighting at least wow. one more. He's got to fight somebody. How cool would, would the zombie and Edson be, man? That'd be great. I don't know. It has me concerned. It all has me concerned. You go off cliff so fast on guys. Like, as soon I, as you decide they shouldn't fight anymore, you're all the way out. <laughs> dude, because I just keep having images of them getting smoked left and right. Like, I could just see Edson just rocking zombie with body shot after body shot of kicks. And it's I just like, too. why? Why do I want to see this? This poor man just getting railed against this. Oh, no, no. I could too. All <sighs> All right. Did we land on anything? Did we give Barboza something to do here? Uh, I guess the Sadiq Yusuf is the logical one. Yeah. I hate it. I hate that, too. I <laughs> wish we had a better option for him, honestly. I really do. Uh, like well, what, are you look, what are you looking for? What do you want him to be doing? I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know. That's a good point. I don't know. I just I feel mean, like he's beating these like up-and-coming guys and not really getting any kind of nothing for it. Nothing, nothing. Man. Yeah. And if I he mean, beats Sadiq Yusuf, then then what? Another nothing. And then we've spent a year doing that's not a, a goddamn one, thing. Though. Yusuf's ranked, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, he's ranked above Edson. Is he ranked above Edson? Yeah, Edson's 14, Yusuf is 12. Yeah, all right. Take that then, I guess. That, makes, <laughs> that definitely makes more sense. There you go. I didn't Come realize on. he was 12. All right. All right. Uh, what about Billy Q? Billy Q, I don't, again, doesn't really move too much. This was a, a fight against somebody who was more, a higher rank than he was. So what, what are we doing with Billy Q? I will say Lerone Murphy. He is still undefeated, keeps winning. He's been a bit inactive, so his, his rise has kind of been stalled, and I think he deserves a chance to try to level up, and I could see Billy Q fitting that bill. I want to know what this song boy's doing. So I don't know what the hell happened to Alex Caceres because we know that he dropped out recently in his last fight that he was scheduled. Right. But if he's good now, yep. I'll do Alex and, and Billy Q. I think that's, I too. that's a banger of a fight. And I think one that both of them can keep a high pace the entire time. Agree. That's a good fight. All right. Uh, moving right along. Pedro Munoz with the Y'all Must Have Forgot unanimous decision. There was a twang there. Unanimous, <laughs> unanimous. <laughs> unanimous decision over quit. Chris Gutierrez. Words are going to be difficult for your boy today. Uh, what a great, great fight from Pedro Munoz. Mark, give us the lowdown. Tell us what you think Pedro Munoz should do from here. You are right. It was a y'all must have forgot. I, uh, 
I tried to emphasize last week how I felt like Munoz was being underrated because of some tough matchups and weird outcomes like the O'Malley one. And I still didn't pick him. I still went Gutierrez. So even I forgot in, in a way. Um, and he showed it. I really think that that bomb that he landed in round one changed the whole fight because I think Gutierrez fought more tentative for a while than he would have otherwise because he just he didn't want to get clipped again. And it kind of seemed like until like past the middle of round two before he kind of looked like himself again. Um, you know, he, he was throwing one shot at a time. He was just being really careful about entering with combos or anything like that that, that would keep him in range for too long. So I, I think he just lost too much of the fight there um, after that. But to Pedro's credit, he was every bit as fast as, as Gutierrez, and we didn't think that. We thought Gutierrez would be the faster man, and Pedro was fucking right with him every exchange. So he still got it. He's still quick as hell. He was the man with the power. He's always been known for his power. And like I said, it, it changed the whole fight just because of round one. So, And honestly, it's probably what, what ensured that he took round three as well because he had a few that really you could tell cracked Gutierrez and it was enough to probably take that round. So he gets a huge win for his career, similar to what I just said about Barbosa, where he kind of is able to stay relevant now, stay in the mix for big fights, maybe get another big one now. And Gutierrez is close, like, He's good. Once he adjusted, that was a really close competitive fight. Another guy who will learn from that one. The skills are there, and I'm sure we'll see him in, in, in something interesting again. Yeah, man. Gutierrez is one of those guys that I think I expected a lot more from in that fight, but I don't even think that he is less skilled than Pedro Munoz. I think his approach to the fight, just especially like when he gets hit, when he got hit specifically in that fight, because Pedro Munoz throws a lot of heat behind those punches. And I think you're right. There was a tentativeness to it, but there was also almost too much respect uh, to a certain extent, right? Like Gutierrez never got that respect back from Pedro Munoz and Pedro Munoz was able to continue that pressure forward and, and land shots and Gutierrez tried to do things, but you could tell he was uh, almost too reactive to a certain extent and never really got to play his game and do the things that he's done um, that's made him successful in the past, even against Frankie Edgar and other people that he's fought. So it was it was a rough night for Gutierrez. I, I, again, I don't think that skill for skill, he is a worse fighter than Pedro Munoz. I think they are very, both very talented in that regard. I think Gutierrez definitely deserves to be in the spot that he's in, if not a little bit higher. I just think his approach to the fight was not the best. Yep. That's a good point. All right. Where does Gutierrez go from here? Oh, no. Sorry. Pedro Munoz. Munoz first. So it's a tough spot to be in, but I think for me, Pedro has just earned being the guy to welcome Umar Namagomedov to the big fights. So that is where I am going to go. I don't hate that at all. I think that's a great fight. And yet my immediate reaction is Umar smokes him. And this is the disrespect yeah. of Pedro Munoz. <laughs> yeah. Man, I mean, Umar is off of a, the, the dude is good. The dude's just come off of a potentially 30-27 fight. Definitely 29-28 for sure, if nothing if nothing more. Yep. Uh, and immediately I'm picking against him in his next fight. Yep. <laughs> it's rough. All right. It is. Uh, what about uh, Chris Gutierrez? Right now he is currently ranked 13th in the Bantamweight division. What are you thinking? I would love to say Jonathan Martinez, who's ranked one spot behind him, just to watch them try to kick each other's legs off. But they train together, so I'm sure that's not happening. So I will go with the one that um, I believe you threw out last week, which is that you thought the loser of this fight should be the next one for Adrian Yanez. And I will go with that. Gutierrez and Yanez. It's tough because one guy would have to lose two in a row, but I think it's the right fight right now. Yeah, but I don't have any allegiance to Chris Gutierrez, so he can <laughs> he can take that L. He can take that L for my man's Yanez all day. Let's go, let's go. I, he's got to work on that head movement, though. If this shit happens again, I'm going to be playing. I, I'm going to play that sound clip. I'm yeah. going to play the sound clip on here if he does this shit again. No, it's true. It's absolutely true. He does have to. All right. Uh, let us continue 
rolling down here with our boy Brandon Royval with the sneaky round one KO of Matthias Nicolau. I'll go first here. Brandon Royval is nasty. The opportunities this man finds, the the millisecond between the seconds that this man is able to capitalize is just is stupid. Um, the, the this fight kind of went the way that we talked about it last week, where Matthias Nicolau was going to be the more measured approached, the the more technical fighter was moving laterally, keeping his distance, measuring, throwing shots when he knew he was able to land them, but not really expending any energy, any, any extra energy in that fight. Brandon Royval is it's kind of like your brother when he first gets a video game right just pushing forward and pressing a the entire time and royval was moving moving throwing jabs moving throwing jabs throwing crosses moving um and never really allowed <coughs> matthias to settle in um and get comfortable and next thing you know brandon royval throws a disgusting knee up the middle Matthias goes full turkey on his legs. It just sprawls out. And it was the beginning of the end. A little ground and pound to seal the deal. But a, a real disgusting victory from Brandon Roy Val. A much needed one, I would imagine, too. Especially in his position. Bro, what a massive statement from Brandon Roy Val. Like, I still can't believe he pulled that off. I, I truly did not think he had that in him against a guy like Nicolau. And I, I think it was the first relevant strike that he landed all fight long. Like, I, I can't even think of anything that landed prior to that. Nikolai was doing kind of, as you said, just what we thought, fighting smart, staying safe. He was in and out, landing here and there. And it looked like, you know, he's playing the typical Nikolai game, and then he fucked up, and Roy Val suckered him in right into that knee. It landed all types of flush. The elbows on the ground were just as flush, and Roy Val gets... I mean, I know he has big wins. Like, he's beaten Kai Car France before, guys like that. But arguably the biggest one of his career just because of, of the way he did it. That was huge. The cleanest, too, when you really think about it. There was no no rolling around, no crazy nonsense, no back nope. and forth, no this and that. I mean, he timed that knee perfectly. I don't even think uh, Nicolau knew what he got hit with because that knee came from underneath, and it hit him right in the jaw from underneath. So I don't even think he saw it. Um, and he went, man, the way his body just folded, just crazy. Absolutely crazy. Um, yep. Good win, man. Really, really good win. Really necessary win, I think. Especially, again, like <clears throat> like I was saying, in his position with the uh, flyweights being so malleable now. You've got Brandon Moreno. You've got Davis and Figueredo. Or, no, you don't have Davis. Well, I guess you kind of do have Davis and Figueredo now. Yeah, he's, he's fighting no cop, remember? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, he's back in the flyweight division now. Uh, you've got Pantoja now that's fighting next. You've got Kai Car France <clears throat> kind of dangling out in the distance here. He's fighting out Bozzi. Oh, well, there you Remember. go. Yeah. So what are we doing with Royval then? Where is Royval going? Because everybody else then is below him. So well, that kind of, that's what kind of leads me to the issue. Um, I don't know what you do with this man right now because, as we said, Moreno's fighting Pantoja. Figgy's fighting Cop. <clears throat> He's already beaten Kai Car France, uh, who is booked against Amir al -Bazi, so... Do you wait and see what happens in that fight? And maybe even if the winner is Kai Car France, you do that rematch because it's been a few years. And if it's Albazi, obviously you can do that. Is he already in line for a title shot where he could just like wait and he's actually going to be the guy who gets the winner of Moreno and Pantoja? Like, I don't entirely know exactly where he's at right now, but it feels like, unfortunately, there's not a perfect answer for what, for what to do with him. Yeah. I don't know. What is the timeline for the Moreno-Pantosha fight? I feel like we just talked about this. It's not for a while, isn't it? That's like that's part of the issue here. It is... Oh, it's sooner than I thought. I take that back. It's in July. For some reason, I thought September. But yeah, July. So if it's in July, you figure nothing crazy happens. Three, four months at the most. So maybe like an end-of-the-year fight. Brandon Royval would have to wait the whole end of the year. Yeah, but see, the thing is that cop... Figueredo fight is on the same card. And if Manel Cop ever beats Figueredo, you know there's going to be a push for him to get that title fight. So, like, I kind of feel like Roy Val should be taking a fight here. I don't know that the waiting is worth it. 
but to take what fight? What fight is good? So, because if, in that regard, then what fight is going to mean more than a Figueiredo fight? Because you can't just take a random fight and then expect to kind of keep in the same momentum if if Cop smokes Figueiredo. If Cop smokes Figueiredo, I think you're just out of luck. But at least if Figueiredo wins that fight. I mean, I guess Roy Val waiting could still put him in position if if Figueredo wins that fight. Yeah, he's just got to maybe sit back and root for Davidson Figueredo. <laughs> maybe that's maybe that's where we're at. <laughs> Damn, that sucks, man. Yeah, he's in a really messed up position. It's it, it kind of yeah. sucks. Although, say Pantoja wins, then Figueredo probably fights for the title again. It's probably Figgy and Pantoja. I mean, I, I don't know. His, his best option, honestly, is probably to stay. Stay in shape, stay fit, stay making weight. Because yeah. if any one of these dudes drops out, he needs to be able to slip right in. It's yeah, that's there's good not point. a lot of movement here, and there's not a lot of room for for fucking around in the flyweight division right now. So he's he's got to stay ready. That's a good point. Yeah, cannot do the Patty Pimblet approach in between fights. Yes. Uh, all right, man. We have made it all the way into our lightning round. All right, man, we are going to go through the rest of this card quickly and easily. Let's start off right at the top here. Azamat Mirzakhanov, UD over Dustin Jacoby. Marco first. This guy's got freaking fight-changing power, man. I I think that's what we... I mean, we kind of knew it, but I still feel like we under underestimated it when we were picking this fight last week. But everything that he landed was solid. It had Jacoby fighting way more defensively and tentatively than I ever imagined that he would. And, like, yes, as the fight went on, you could kind of see Jacoby's technique starting to take over a little bit. The cardio probably played a role, too, as we got to round three. But it was too late. Uh, you know, Azamat did a fantastic job. He came out hard. Knocked Jacoby off his game, and he and he took the first ten minutes absolutely. Yeah, dude, the, the the power was absolutely crazy, and I thought Jacoby would be able to take those shots a, a, even better than he did because let, let's be clear, Same. Jacoby is a goddamn tank, uh, and yeah. he took a lot of those shots. Not a lot of people would have been able to take, especially a couple of the uppercuts that were kind of snuck in there, thinking that they were going to come from a different angle. So he walked right into him, still didn't go down. Um, he's an absolute tank and, uh, Merzikhanov definitely did enough work in the first two rounds to, to, to do enough to win that fight. But the third round, man, Jacoby poured it on, uh, and really had Merzikhanov breathing hard, but good, good fight, good fight overall. And, uh, a good win for Merzikhanov. He's a weird guy. I still can't quite evaluate how good I think he is. I mean, he's undefeated, but like, it's like, I don't know. For some reason I'm like, is he that good? I mean, I think it's going to, especially if he can't put his hands on somebody, I think he's going to be fine lacking. You know what I mean? And yeah. guys are probably going to really be able to get off on him if he can't land any uh, any of those punches. But if he does yeah. land, you could see it's, I mean, it pushes people all the way back. Dude. For I mean, sure. It's, 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 crazy. it's big power. It's big yeah. power. Uh, next on the list here, Eon Kunte Laba, round one TKO over Tanner Bozer. I'll go first. Uh, Kunte Laba needed this win 100%. Um, I think you saw the the intensity after the fight was over, and good on Kute Laba, man. I mean, this was, I, I, you know, I, we didn't really talk about it last week. I think I took Kute Laba just because, um, and Tanner Bozer, physically, I think it was definitely the best Tanner Bozer I think we've ever seen. Definitely the yeah, smallest Tanner good. Bozer I've ever seen. Um, but it really didn't matter, man, because Tanner <laughs> Bozer still lacks a little bit in that technique department. And Ian Kunte Laba is inconsistent, but technique for from a technique standpoint, I thought he always had the edge. So good on good on Kunte Laba for getting a nice win. Something else now to add to his highlight reel. Yeah, the speed was a big factor. You could tell Bozer was struggling with it, being used to fighting heavyweights and having to deal with the speed of Kunte Laba. Kunte Laba was landing first in nearly every exchange. He was closing the distance really quickly, and he got inside with a huge right that hurt Bozer and started everything and. If it's the first round and Kute Laba has you hurt and he still has his gas tank, you're in big trouble because he is an animal at, at that point, and he poured it on. And as you said, he needed this one bad, and he got it, so good on him. Yeah. Hafa Garcia, UD over Clay Guida, Marco first. He put a lot of his fists in Clay Guida's face. Um, every time Clay tried to close the distance, Garcia would stuff or quickly clinch. 
and he had some pretty good phone booth style shots to to kind of back Guido off him as well. And I don't for one reason or another, it seemed like Clay just got kind of deterred from even trying to use the wrestling as the fight went on. But he was paying for it because he, he didn't really have another avenue, and uh, he got pieced up. So a nice win for Garcia. Yeah, I'm a little surprised that uh, Clay Guida didn't retire after that fight. Yeah. Uh, he definitely fucked around and pissed some people off with his fake yeah, that was retirement bullshit. birthday speech. Yep. Um, but Clay Guida looked slow in there, man. He looked slow. He didn't look strong in there. Um, I thought this was one of those performances where I, I think you could see that he's not really able to hang as well with a lot of these guys that are not even at the very tippity top of the division. Um, and he's been around for a long time and he's, he's definitely one of the OGs at this point. So, you know, I'm, I'm not thrilled about him not retiring cause I thought it was about time, but, um, Hoffa Garcia put on a great performance. I thought he won all three rounds. Yep. I thought his ability to switch up and adapt to moving forward, um, taking the bait from clay. Cause at one point clay was trying to lure him in and I don't think it really mattered all that much. So, good for Garcia, man. It was a great performance. Uh, did you go? I didn't even realize. I you went, went, yes. You went. All right, moving right along then. Bill Algio, round two submission over TJ Brown. Go first. These boys were in a dogfight in round one. Uh, Brown got dropped a couple times. Algio's nose is leaking. But as good as TJ was looking through a lot of these exchanges – you get in these like all gas dog fights with Bill Algio and you run the risk because he thrives in these. He thrives in the phone booth style fights and the chaos. And that's exactly where he caught TJ. It was a short check elbow as TJ moved in that hurt him bad. And then as much as he tried, he just couldn't escape the pressure and eventually had a tap. So another nice one for Bill Algio. Dude, when this happened, I didn't even see the elbow. I had no idea what happened. I had no idea why he dropped. I had it was it happened so quickly and so cleanly that I I had no idea what what had gone on. Yeah. Um Bill Algio's a beast though, man. I mean, he's another one. He just he reminds me so much of Billy Q. It drives me crazy because they both have this like forward pressure, this crazy tenacity. Um they they have decent chins. I mean, I know, you know, Billy Q just got knocked out, but overall they have really good chins. Um and it was a good submission, man. I mean, it was another opportunistic submission. They were going back and forth. They were exchanging a lot. They were rolling around a lot. And he just got to a point where he found something he was able to sink in, and he did it. Did it, did it well. It was a great finish. Uh, next on the list, Zach Cummings. Uh, round three TKO over Ed Herman. I'll go first. Uh, probably the best Zach Cummings I've seen, to be honest. Uh, moved well. The striking, I thought, was pretty crisp. Uh, definitely had power on his side. Granted, he was fighting Ed Herman, who Ed Herman hasn't really had the best performances of late. Has looked very slow, looked very much his age. Um, and just looks like somebody, I think, who's, you know, I, I would imagine still just fighting for a paycheck at that point. Um, but I thought it was a good fight, man. I, I thought it was a, a gritty fight. Ed Herman took a lot of damage in that fight up until the end. Um, but I thought it was a good good accounting from, from Zach Cummings. Zach Cummings and Ed Herman both retired after that fight at the same time, putting down their gloves. Uh, Cummings wanted to kind of go out showing his daughter what he did. He goes out on a win. And Ed Herman has been around for a long goddamn time. Um, he is taking a lot of damage throughout his entire career. And I'm glad he's deciding to move on and doing things, uh, you know, different things now in his life and without getting destroyed in the head. I hope I don't see him in power slap in the next 12 months because <laughs> it would make me sad. Yeah, bro. Thank God Ed Herman decided this was the end because he was taking some damn itch in there. I mean, Cummings' hands were twice as fast. He was landing so clean so often. Ed Herman's chin was too good for his own health. So... Honestly, beautiful, beautiful performance from Cummings. As you said, he gets the retirement in his hometown. Uh, I'm sure that was cool for him, but props to both dudes. Two solid UFC careers. Cummings was actually 10 and four in the UFC, which is wild. Doesn't feel like that. Yeah. Um, and both battled, you know, to the end. Yeah. Jillian Robinson, round two submission of Pieta 
Rodriguez, Marco first. Yeah, man, I was excited to see Jillian down at 115, and she looked good. She is a beast of a grappler, and we know this, but she never seems to get as much credit as she should get for it, and she showed it in spades here. She got taken down early in round one, reversed the position, controlled all the rest of that round, comes out in round two, goes right back to it, immediate takedown, back to work, doesn't rush anything, you know, tries all different setups, waits for the opening to come, takes Matt more than once, just dominating, and then... You know, Pierre gives it to her. She she lasted a while, but she finally made one mistake, and boom, armbar, fight over. So, interested to see more from Jillian at this weight. Yeah, one hundred percent. Jillian Robinson, if nothing else, man, is a worker. She's one of these girls that's not really going to stop moving. Um, when she has the ability to get the position on you, she's going to continue to move until she tries to get something that's going to work, get a submission, better position, ground and pound, like whatever the opportunity is. Um, She's she's good, man. I, it's it's interesting because you would expect her to be a lot more liked and respected because of her approach to the game. But sometimes I think there there has been I don't want to say stalling in her fights, but some of her fights have not always been I think as entertaining as it seems that they have been recently. Um, so hopefully she gets uh, the credit that she does. I think it deserves. She's she's definitely made her style a lot more entertaining and and has been getting a lot more uh, finishes. I feel like as of late. And I don't know what Rodriguez was complaining about. I, I thought she tapped as well. Uh, yeah, I, thought, I did too. I thought she was trying to play that, that heckin' game there where yeah, she's saying she tapped, didn't tap kind of thing. And that's why I keep telling Mike, see, if that would have happened and you would have felt it and would have let go as a result of thinking this person tapped, now you got somebody jumping on top of you and fucking you up and like i didn't tap i didn't say i tapped yeah well that was one single tap i don't expect anybody to let go for one single tap um but i on the flip from piera like you can't be slapping someone's knee while you're in a submission whether you meant to or not like yeah, it's the ref's job to see a tap and you tapped yeah and she was in a bad spot i don't know how much longer yeah. she really expected to, to hang in there but agree all right Let's move right along here. Daniel Zellhuber. Unanimous decision over Lando Venata. I will go first. Um, Lando's another one, man, who I feel like we expected a lot from. He's never really lived up to his potential. Generally a guy with a a small gas tank. um, Doesn't really get past round one without losing a lot of the technique and a lot of the flash and things like that. And, man, I think he got worked in this fight, dude. Uh, Zell Huber was was dangerous early. Um, definitely an argument to be made for a 10-8 round. I'm, I'm, I, f- I feel like p- because Lando still ended up getting up in the end and still seemed like he had his wherewithals, I think a couple of the judges didn't give him a 10-8 round. But that dude looked like he almost got finished like four times. So I, I feel like a 10-8 round is 100% warranted. Um, regardless though, Daniel Zellhuber definitely did enough to win all those rounds, uh, at least two out of the three rounds. I feel like round three was a little, uh, um, two, two was the, close was it one. two? Yeah. So I still think Zellhuber did enough. Uh, it was a good fight, but Lando, I don't know. I don't know how much more of this Lando I want to watch because it's just him taking a lot of damage. It looks good. Visibly, visually looks nice. But it's just not effective enough, and he's getting fucked up. Yeah, I thought Zell Huber looked really good, man. That that was the guy that kind of got hyped up back when he debuted and fell super flat against Trey Ogden. So now you see why he had the hype, because he looked like a totally different fighter here. Uh, he out lando Lando in terms of, like, the slick striking game coming from all different angles. And because he was kind of on the same level as him there... The fact that he was longer and had the reach really became a big factor, and he just kind of kept picking Lando apart. And he beat him up bad in in round one, so a nice win for him. Yeah. All right, next on the list, Denise Gomes, round two TKO of Bruno Brazil. I will go first. Uh, I I, I think Gomes found an opportunity, man, because I feel like Brazil was, was, was winning that fight. I thought she is. She was better in the clinch. She had better control. She seemed like the stronger woman overall. Um, I thought she had a lot of nice combinations throughout that fight. Good amount of distance management, but in the end, it didn't mean shit because Gomes knocked her ass down and pounded her ass into submission. 
Um, and that was all she wrote, man. So Gomes with a nice, from, from, from my perspective, come from behind win uh, against Bruno Brazil. Yeah, this was another one where the range was a factor, but kind of in the opposite way. Uh, Brazil was longer, and it seemed like she kept thinking that she was like safely out of range. And she would be leaving her hands down, and then she would just get cracked. So, And then she would even keep her hands down after that. So it was a unique strategy. It just seemed like she was way too comfortable thinking, oh, I'm longer, you know, I'm safe out here. And she wasn't because Gomes is intense, man. She had her foot on the gas, and she kind of just tried to run her over. And eventually she did. That right was clean, and then some nasty ground and pound to finish it off. Yep. Gaston Bolanos, UD over Aaron Phillips. Go for his mark. Yeah, the Bellator vet makes his UFC debut. He uh, gets a good win here. He did struggle at times with the grappling. He's certainly primarily a kickboxer, so not shocking that that was the case. But he is a dangerous kickboxer, and it showed, and he rode that to a debut victory. So pretty close fight, honestly. Um, you know, Phillips was in it, but I thought Bolanos uh, edged it. Yeah, I definitely thought Bolanos was the better fighter overall. You can kind of see the discrepancy between the two. Um, Aaron Phillips honestly kind of looked like he was trying to keep up in there. Um, definitely looked like the guy who's, who, whose gas was going a lot faster um, than Bolanos was. And, and like I said, just tried to keep up in there. Didn't really seem like he was going for a win past a certain point. Um, so good performance from Bolanos, and we'll see what's next for him. Last on the list, the <laughs> Jocelyn Edwards... Split decision over Lucy Pudilova. Do you want to go first? This this fight is fucking crazy. I'm going to surprise you with what I'm going to say. You thought she won that fight? Not that I thought she won. But I thought round one was like kind of arguable. Like I, I scored it for Pudilova. But it started with Edwards landing like a six-piece combo. Then we end up on the ground. Pudilova kind of does nothing the whole time they're on the ground, like a little bit here and there. I know it was a long time on the ground, but she didn't do that much. And then when they're back up, Ed Edwards puts it on her again for like 20 more seconds. So like kind of as soon as it happened, I was like, mm, I wonder if we get any weird cards on that round. And obviously we did, but I, I just, I don't think. And so I, then obviously I thought, um, that Pudilova won round two. And then again, three was close, but I kind of thought Edward, Edwards might have taken three. So yeah. I can't say I'm shocked. Like, it wasn't, was it a perfect decision? No, but was it like the worst decision we've ever seen? I don't know that I thought that. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't care for it at all, to be honest. I thought Pudilova had done enough to win, to win rounds one and two. I gave Edwards round three. Um, but yeah, I don't. I don't know. Like, I, I'm not even the type of guy that, like, advocates for ground control and all this shit but at the same time <laughs> it's got to count for something and you can't yeah again whole... i scored it for Pudilova, but yeah you can't send, spend the whole goddamn round on your back throw six punches in and then be like oh i won the round i don't know i don't know. yeah seems odd like if she rocked her or something dropped her that's a different story i guess I'm actually curious now. I haven't looked at MMA decisions. Let's see. Let's see. I hope MMA decisions tells you your decision is bullshit. Round one. 16% of people gave it to Edwards. So I'm not alone in thinking that it was arguable. Um, but yeah, obviously the large that's, bulk. That's That's the stretch you're going with there? I mean, sixteen percent. It's not. It's not two percent. Um, and then yeah, ninety six percent Pudilova round two, and sixty percent Edwards round three. So only, only ten percent of people scored that fight for Edwards. But uh, but that's what I'm. That's kind of what I'm trying to say. Like, usually this kind of like uproar is a fight that like ninety eight percent of people scored for one person. Like. There were ten percent of people that thought Edwards won this fight. I don't know, whatever. Yeah. I'm sure. I'm sure people are going to be hating on me for that take, but that's all right. Ten percent <laughs> of the people are wrong. It's all good. <laughs> all right, we have done it, and that is the end of our lightning round. 
right. And right along into our very own Prio rankings where Mark tells you to throw away the UFC rankings because they mean nothing and to go with his rankings because they are well thought out and just overall better. <laughs> Fuck the UFC rankings. Uh, Mark, go ahead. Uh, I actually wanted to check something. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So we have four risers and one faller this week. We will start with the uh, the depressing news first, I guess, for one guy, which is Tanner Boser. I didn't know exactly where to rank him at light heavyweight when he dropped down. You know, he was maybe around 20-ish, 21, something like that in my heavyweight rankings. But he had beaten OSP and Felipe Linz, who were both, you know, fairly respectable light heavyweights. So I actually inserted him at number 13 and... uh I've moved him all the way down to number 22 now uh, off of that loss to, to Kute Lava. So I, that might have been a bit too aggressive. So he falls nine spots. And then the uh, risers, I will work up from, from the bottom of the card. We have Daniel Zellhuber. He was down at number 74. Obviously, he had only had one fight. He was 0-1. Now he beats Lando Venata, who's a guy that does have some quality wins at certain points. So Zellhuber goes all the way up to number 46 in my lightweight rankings. Um. Next riser is Rafa Garcia. He's a guy who had kind of been up and down. He was at number 49 in my lightweight rankings. He gets a pretty legitimizing win and moves up from 49 to 36 with the win over Clay Guida. Uh, next one is the flip side of that faller, which is Iwan Kutelaba. He was down at number 26. He jumps back up to 21. So kind of reigniting himself a little bit. We'll see if he can actually string a couple wins together. And then the last one is the uh, only man who officially moved into a top 15 for me this week, and he did in the UFC as well, which is Azamat Mercikanov. He was number 19 at middleweight for me. I now have him at number 13. and uh, Sorry, not middleweight. Um, light heavyweight, excuse me. I now have him at number 13, and for reference, the UFC actually has him all the way up at number 11. So he is a guy that's making moves for sure. And that so is it for this week's ranking update. Yeah, I don't know about putting him over Dominic Reyes. Like, I know Dominic Reyes is on a slide, but that seems a little silly. Let's let him prove personal. a little bit more. <laughs> seems personal is what it is. It's yeah. People don't want Dominic Reyes there no more. And I kind of get it. Like, he hasn't looked great, dude. His performances have been less than thrilling. I get it. But, like, you can't just say because a guy beat Dustin Jacoby and a few randoms that we're going to rank him over Dominic Reyes. Like, it, it has to be – you have to earn it a little more than that. Well, give Mirza Khan off Dominic Reyes, then. That's Let the fight it out. for you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, so, yeah. Where are we going next? We are going right into our PFL 3 of the regular 2023 season recap with Mark. Uh, I guess let's start here with the o Olivier Obama Mercier OAM unanimous decision over Shane Burgos. I uh, I was pretty dis dis displeased with this fight, and for a couple of reasons, right? Like, OAM did what OAM does. He worked for the takedown, worked to nullify, worked to stop Shane Burgos from doing anything Shane Burgos wanted to do. Um, pushed the pressure. Never really was a, a a knockout threat during that fight but also never let Shane Burgos become a real threat in that fight either. Um, and Shane Burgos, to the same extent, as, as frustrating as a performance like that might be from OAM visually, it was equally frustrating to watch Shane Burgos almost accept that. Um, and he didn't really seem to have an answer for it. And, and his frustration took over, and I think his frustration allowed time to go by that he didn't really have to fuck around. Um, you know, had moments where he was trying to blitz and then getting caught again, you know, in, 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 in the middle of a takedown attempt. Uh, and again, never really was able to do anything significant in that fight, unfortunately. So a rough showing for Shane Burgos. Everybody was hyping him up for this fight. Shane Burgos was hyping himself up for this fight. Uh, 155, what could it be? And it wasn't great, man. It wasn't great. It's not like Shane Burgos got run over, but we didn't even really get to see anything from Shane Burgos, and that is almost equally as disappointing. 
Yeah, I had a little bit more of a positive OAM take than you. I, I get it that it got kind of boring in the second half of the fight, but the, fir- the, the first takedown only came late round two. I, I thought for the first half of that fight, he, he was kind of scrapping in there. He was in and out of range beautifully. He, As you said, he's always hard to hit. Uh, he was mixing up the levels on his attacks. He had some nasty body kicks, calf kicks. The jab was landing, and, and I actually thought he came out pretty aggressively in round one. Uh, I don't know if he felt that he needed to set a tone like that against a guy who kind of has a rep of, of being a killer in, in Burgos, um, but that's what he did. He, he really set a tone, and Burgos is prone to starting slow sometimes, which we know, yeah. and he really did get behind early, and he kind of let OAM settle into his groove. And then in round one, when Burgos up to the pace for a little bit, OAM was like exchanging with him. And I, I still thought even then he was staying right with him. But then that's when he was kind of like, all right, boom, I, I have the ability to switch it up. And that's what I'm going to do. And you could see that he did that. He started mixing in the takedowns, um, ended up backpacking Burgos, which is exactly what Burgos did to Jordan in his last fight. Uh, round three, he goes back to the grappling completely after he saw the effectiveness, backpacks him some more. And, yeah, he basically shut Burgos down. So we know Burgos is a tough dude. We obviously know he's skilled. But the the variety and well-roundedness of OAM is just a lot to overcome at this point. And I really feel like he has improved his striking a lot in the yeah. PFL. Again, I know he went away from it late. But the first half of that fight, he was outstriking Shane Burgos. And I, I think OAM ha- has reached a pretty solid level right now. Yeah, I mean, he's definitely got some good fundamentals, and I think the reason he had to switch it up was I think it got to a point where Shane Burgos might have been able to start reading him um, and kind of getting the timing down. And I think once Shane Burgos started to get a little bit more comfortable in that area, OAM was like, nope, sorry. Try yeah. to get comfortable in this area. Yep. Um, okay. And I think you're right, man. And, and this is not going to – OAM is not the only guy in there that wrestles like that and, and or at least attempts to wrestle like that and – and take things down to the ground. I think Shane Burgos is going to have a, a tough time if he's not able to keep these guys off of him. If you're going to be a 155, especially, and you're coming up in weight, you got to be ready for this shit, man, because OAM is probably walking around out there at like 170, 175. So you, you got to get your shit together. Here. Yeah. No, that's true. All right. Any other PFL things you want to recap real quick? How did the uh, the other ones go? I saw Sadabu C caught a case, so that was good. For him. He did, yeah. I, I'll give. A, I'll run down the card. I'll give like a one sentence recap of each of these since I gave you guys a little preview on them last week. By the way, for what it's worth, your boy went nine and zero on the PFL picks last week, and I gave you the finish for seven out of the nine. So that's pretty fucking good. I had a little bit of a weak UFC card last week, but we are going to ignore that. And focus on the PFL. <laughs> um, so, yeah, j- just real quick moving down the card. Um, Clay Collard won a UD over Yamato Nishikawa. Uh, Nishikawa was tough, but he went in there to strike against a guy who just seemed to be levels above. Clay Collard was treating him like a fucking heavy bag. So, great fight for Collard. Um, real quick, though, those leg kicks. <coughs> like, I know, I know Collard. I did see some of the highlights there. The, Collard was putting in work, and Nishikawa looked like he was a little fucked up. But the leg yes. kicks, yes, okay. those are those were disgusting. Like yes. Clay Carter looked like he wanted to hold on to his legs so bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's good. That dude, he's good. He just he ate too many hands. Yeah. Um. Then we had Dennis Goltsov, who actually ended up with a late replacement opponent in Cesar Ferreira, former UFC vet who has fought in the PFL oh, before. Yeah. He stepped up and took the heavyweight fight here as a late replacement, and he actually looked quick on the feet early. But as soon as Goltsov got the takedown. It was just, you know, you could tell that Ferreira was stuck under a much bigger man, and then ground and pound started coming, and we had a round one TKO for Goltsov there. Um, Another round one finish, Carlos Leal, the man that beat Ray Ray Cooper last season. Uh, He got a round one KO of David Zawada. His hands looked sharp all fight. He was walking Zawada down. Um, Zawada kind of tried to start going first. And walk at him to change the pace, and he walked right into a beautiful counter from Leal that put him down. So that was that. Uh, Magomedu Malatov had another round one knockout of Delano Taylor. Not really anything happened in this fight. It was just some kind of staring down and little pitter-patter nothings, and then a huge right hand that just rocked Taylor badly, and, and Umlatov swarmed. But that's kind of what he is. He just carries huge power, and he shows it again. Um, as you mentioned... Sadabusi in the kind of other main event of the night on this weird card. 
he fought well early, but also also Ali was doing his best to close the distance and not let C play that kind of patented range game that he plays a lot. And he paid for it because he closed the distance right into a knee to the body that shut him off, and, and Sadabusi gets a round two TKO. So nice for him. Uh, Magomed, Magomed Karimov, round one knockout of Ben Egli. Maga just walked him down from jump. You could tell he didn't respect him at all. He was absolutely walking him down and landed a gorgeous head kick to end that one. Uh, two more, Haush Manfio with a UD over Alex Martinez. Competitive fight, but Haush was landing more, landing harder, doing more damage, mixed in some, take, some takedowns. Nice W for him. And then the last one was Natan Schultz with a UD over Stevie Ray. Um, Ray, you know, had his moments last season, as we said, but Schultz was was a tough matchup. He brought the pressure. He leaned on the wrestling, and he was just too much for Ray. Ray, Ray was stuck on his back, and he couldn't get up all, all fight long. So that is it. That was the uh, the rundown of PFL 3, and now we can uh, move into the sphere here and then get to all of our millions of previews. Kind of Christ. All right. We are rolling here. Uh, let's jump right into inside the MMA sphere with your boy. Um Alex Pereira announcing that his next fight will be officially at 205 pounds at light heavyweight. Dana White also saying that light heavyweight, uh, while it will be his next step, he will not be getting a title shot right from jump, that he will need to fight and beat some real guys at light heavyweight to to get a title shot. Um, So it'll be interesting to see what his next fight, who his next fight is going to be. Probably in the, I would imagine, like the Anthony Smith area. Ooh. Excuse me. Something like that. Uh, next on the list here, they are playing with my man Benil Dariush. So we found out that Benil Dariush and Charles Oliveira had to be postponed due to a Charles Oliveira injury. Uh, was pushed back about a month. And I think now instead of it being in May, it's in June, if I got that right. Um, and Dariush went on... One of these shows here, uh, the Schmo, gross, and he basically was like, basically the way they put it is, I'm not the number one contender. Uh, they said that there's people ahead of me, and they pointed specifically to Dustin Poirier, and at that point, I was about to flip the table. So, seemingly the rumor. What did you say? So I saw a article today that maybe suggests things have improved. Because I saw quotes from Benil saying that when he accepted the new date for Charles, that he said, if he pulls out again, I want the title fight. And they apparently have said yes. Okay. Well, damn. All right. Good. Benil went gangster on him. It's about goddamn time. Good. Yeah. Well, because Benil deserves that title shot. And if he doesn't do something like that, he's going to keep getting passed up time and time again. Um, and I think Dustin Poirier might be looking at a Gilbert Burns fight. Uh, which leads me right into our next little wild if that tidbit really here. Gilbert Burns out here calling out Dustin Poirier for UFC 288 in May, which is not that far away at this point, uh, trying to pump up the May 6th card. Uh, as of right now, Gilbert Burns does not have an opponent for 288, but supposedly he is scheduled for 288 somehow. Um, but all signs point to him being on the card and potentially with Dustin Poirier as a dance partner. Um Poirier would have to obviously fight at 170 at this point. He's he's talking about he's not really in quote unquote fight shape, um, but he's down to make a bag. So there is that. Dude, how wild would it be if he takes that fight and wins, Smokes and then him. Colby beats Leon, and we just fall right into the grudge match of Dustin and Colby for the title? I can tell you right now, if Gilbert Burns doesn't take down Dustin Poirier and work him on the ground, he's going to okay. get smoked, hundred percent smoked, no question. Yeah, that's 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 Gilbert Burns' ass right there. If he tries to stand with with Poirier, um, what a fucking what a turn of events, though. Imagine. I mean, just... I kind of don't think this is gonna happen, to be honest. But I don't know who Gilbert would fight. I I I heard today they were considering going away from Gilbert, and that they tried to make the new co-main. Again, I don't know what fucking weight class this would be. It's all these cross weight class things that they tried to make the new co-main Jan Blahovich and Paolo Costa. But that apparently that then fell apart as well. So well, I, I don't know. What class do you think it would be? It's not gonna. It can't be one eighty five. No way. Paulo Costa is making weight in less than a month. That Why? boy needs like that boy needs like three months. Three months. To I think we're gonna say it can't be one eighty five because of Jan. 
But Jan's been talking about coming to 185 to fight yeah. Izzy again. So I don't. I, who knows? Like it's probably going to be a two. Way more responsible about making weight at this <laughs> point than fucking Paulo Costa. Yeah, I don't know. It's gonna. We'll see what happens. All right, next on the list here, uh, we have a new headliner for April 29th after Renato Moicano. Uh, oh no, sorry, no headliner for the April 29th uh, card. No, we do, Renato we Moicano. do. Who's on there now? The one that so the co-main this weekend was supposed to be. Um, Yadong Song and Ricky Simone, and it has now been made the headliner on that card. Very nice. So they Thank delayed them one that. week. I guess both guys said they weren't weren't too tight about the delay, and uh, we're fine with five rounds, I guess. And they probably got some money thrown at them. And there we go. Yeah. So Mano Boicano drops out. Armin Sarukian, I guess, ends up getting screwed in the in the situation. I think he's getting booked with somebody else, though, isn't he? I don't think or I saw they, anything no. about Armin. Um, it could be, but I, not that I remember seeing. All right. Well, let's get into some of these fight announcements, and we will continue to move into this weekend's cards. Uh, first on the list here, Jonathan Pierce is out against his fight with Bryce Mitchell. Bryce Mitchell will now be fighting Mavsar Ivloyev at I like it more. on May 6th. I agree. Uh, Phil Hawes back in action against Ikram... Aliskarov. Aliskarov. Uh, he has been added to the, again, 288 card on May 6th. I'm honestly fine with him fighting some no-name dude. Let this let this boy figure out where the fuck he is. I then... guess. I, that's, a, that's a debuting fighter, I guess. I don't even know who that is. I'm totally fine with it. Um, moving right along here, they really built out the May 20th card over the last week, it looks like, so we're going to run down a few of the fights in this card. Uh, we're going to start here with Joaquin Buckley versus Andre Fialio. Uh, Orion Kose. Wait, what? What weight is that at? That is at welterweight. Wow, Joaquin Buckley down to welterweight, huh? Wow. Makes sense. Makes sense. I mean, yeah. I didn't know if we'd ever see it, but wow, that's interesting. Okay. Does make Sorry, me wonder cool. if he ever fights uh, Big Mouth again, considering it seems like they're cool and shit now. So mm. be interesting. So what was the uh, next Orion one? Kose. Kose. You're good. Orion Kose versus Gilbert Urbina has been added to USC Vegas card on May 20th as well. Uh, Victoria Leonardo versus Natalia Silva has also been added. Chase Hooper back in the mix versus Nick Fior. And last on the list, headlining the May 20th card, Raquel Pennington versus Irene Aldana 2. Um, noticing Raquel Pennington putting that one a little close there because... Tisha about to pop. Tisha is eight months pregnant, dog. Oh, yeah? Huh. Yeah. That girl is liable to go into labor, I feel like, at any point once we get to the point, once we get to May 20th. So, And when's that she... fight? May 20th. The fight's on May 20th? Yeah. Oh, wow. Jeez. Wow. She's pushing it. If, yeah. if this was Mike, he'd be like, no, no, I can't do it. <laughs> so, Pennington showing that she's about that life, I guess. Um, next on the list, Nasruddin Imavov versus Chris Curtis has recently been announced. Oh, wow. added I didn't see that. To UFC 289 on so, June 10th. It's a good fight. Uh, and last on the list, we've alluded to earlier throughout our discussions here today, Davidson Figueiredo versus Manel Kopp is in the works for UFC 290 on July 8th for International Fight Week. And that is all we have for the sphere this week. Nice. Uh, let us good pace right now baby good pace i love it i love it we are an hour and change in it's fairly brief previews and this is really where the meat and potatoes is about to be man because we got a lot of shit to cover yes so let's get into it real quick here bellator 294 liz carmouche versus bennett two uh do you mark want to highlight any of the other fights that are going down this weekend on that card Let's not. Let's keep this thing moving. Let's get right into the main All card. All right. The hell with the rest of the card. <laughs> Let's start out here with Danny Sabatello versus Marcos Breno. Uh, Mark, why don't you go first and give us the rundown here of these guys. Okay. I just realized I forgot to input the odds, so I'm just checking. Okay. The favorite is Danny Sabatello. He is minus 500. Uh, Marcos Breno is the underdog at plus 375. Uh, so, uh, Marcos Breno is a very good fighter. 
his only loss in any recent years is to Taylor Lapalus, who's like arguably the best bantamweight that's not in a major organization. Um, he just beat Josh Hill in his Bellator debut, who's, who's a pretty established dude. But all that being said, I think he's kind of being fed to Sabatello in a way here. Sabatello is the much bigger man. He's five inches taller than Breno. And I think that style for style, Sabatello has a game that can stop Breno's game because Breno's dangerous on the feet, but I don't think he's going to get to spend a ton of time there because Sabatello is just such a good wrestler. And while Breno has some game off his back, I think Sabatello is just so comfortable there as well. So I, I don't know that Sabatello is going to be able to be deterred here. So I, I kind of think he is just going to cruise to a UD in, in typical Danny Sabatello fashion. Very nice. Very nice. I've never heard of this Marcos Breno chap here. I've not watched him. It'd right. be a little difficult for you to make a pick. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I agree. I agree. Um, I'm going to go with Danny Sabatello just because I know his, whether you love it or you hate it, it's effective in his ground game and his control. Um, I don't know much about Marcos Breno, but I don't think he's going to be the type to be able to keep Danny Sabatello off him for three rounds. So I'll go with Danny Sabatello by unanimous decision. All right. Next on the list here, Sarah McMahon versus Arlene Blenkow. Uh, Sarah McMahon here with 13 wins, six losses, one by KO, five by submission, and seven by decision. Her most recent fight, a win over Cal Rosa, and just before that, uh, Juliana Pena, both in the UFC. So Sarah McMahon making her Bellator debut here. Totally unbeknownst to me. Um, <laughs> and Arlene Blenkow not making her Bellator debut for sure. Much seasoned here in this area, having recently just fought Cyborg uh, just a few, oh, like a year ago. Um, so Arlene Blenkow has got 15 wins and nine losses, eight by KO, one by submission, and six decisions. Uh, this, I feel like this is a really interesting fight, man, because Sarah McMahon has been inconsistent, but, but she's got skill, man. She's got technique. I just, reality is, I don't think she likes getting hit. And whenever she gets hit really well, I think she just folds and she crumbles. Um, Arlene Blenkow is one of those girls that will hit very hard. If she gets the ability to, she will land a shot on you. And I don't know if Sarah McMahon is going to want to take shots from, uh, from Blenkow. Um, I do believe Sarah McMahon is going to have the, the wrestling advantage in general over Arlene Blenkow and could definitely ride out three rounds on top of Blenkow for sure. Um, and I'm going to go with that, but I wouldn't be surprised if Arlene is able to put hands on her at some point. So I will go with Sarah McMahon by unanimous decision. I think that's an accurate take. I'm in pretty much the same boat. Um, seems like the... The uh, lines are as well. McMahon is minus 200. Blenko is plus 160, so not terribly wide, but McMahon a clear favorite. Mm -hmm. um, I tend to think Sarah McMahon is better. Uh, Blenko has been solid in Bellator. Her only recent losses are to, like, Cyborg a couple times, Julia Butt a couple times, and that's about it. But I just think the depth in Bellator is severely lacking compared to what Sarah McMahon has been fighting in the UFC. I know this is obviously up a weight class from where we're used to seeing Sarah McMahon, but I don't think that's going to be a huge issue for her. She's plenty strong enough, and the style matchup helps because Blenko is very much a striker and not hugely well-rounded, and McMahon obviously is going to look to lean on the wrestling, and I don't think should see a lot of resistance in that department as long as she can close that distance and get her hands on Blenko. So as you said, she's got to be careful to not get clipped because Blenko definitely carries power and can absolutely clip Sarah McMahon. But uh, I will place my chips on the side of a wrestling-based UD for Sarah McMahon. Sweet. All right. Trucking <laughs> right along here. Tim Johnson versus Sai Salma. Next on the list here, Tim Johnson with 15 wins and nine losses. Eight wins by KO, three by submission, and four by decision. Uh, Tim Johnson, also the older gentleman at 38 years old, as Mike would like to remind you, probably not going to do very well as a result. Uh, has <laughs> is coming off of three losses to Valdin, Valentin Moldovsky, Fedor Emelianenko, and Linton Vassell. 
Uh, all very, very good fighters, but three losses in a row nonetheless. Said Salman knows a little bit about that with two in a row off of Gokhan Sarakam and Davion Franklin. Um, Said Salma has eight wins and four losses, five by KO, one by submission, and two by decision. The younger gentleman by eight years at 30 years old. Mark, why don't you take this one first and tell us where you think this fight is headed. All right, I'm just checking one thing because I wrote down that Tim Johnson has a three-inch height advantage, but that doesn't feel right. It looks like, according to SureDog, he has two. He says 6'3 okay. here and 6'1 okay. for Said Salma. Close enough. I guess maybe I looked elsewhere, but yeah, okay. So anyway, uh, the favorite here is Said Salma. He's minus 200. Tim Johnson oh. is plus 160. Funny, same exact odds as last fight. Okay. Um, Johnson is bigger. He's got a two-inch height and two-inch reach advantage. I always struggle to evaluate Said Salma. He surprises me kind of often, like especially when he beat um, Vitaly Minikov. I did not see that coming. Uh, Tim Johnson on the other side is getting older. You wonder if maybe he's starting to kind of fall off a bit here. Granted, as you said, it's been pretty top-flight competition that he's losing to. So just because I... For whatever reason, I never end up being sold on the game of Saeed Salma. I'm going to roll with the underdog here, kind of to take one underdog on this card as well. I, I will say Tim Johnson wins it just by virtue of being more well-rounded, a little grittier. I think he can make it ugly and eke out a decision, but this could go the other way too, where Salma kind of keeps it cleaner and it, and it goes his way. I, I think it hinges on that, what kind of fight we see here. But I, I'll say Tim Johnson and I'll say split decision. Do you remember that the the Salma Minikoff fight? Because I feel like I remember that ending pretty dumb. It ended dumb in that Minikov hurt his finger and and they called it, but Minikov was already losing and he was was losing, kind of needing like a big finish, and and uh, then it just ended anyway. But but Salma was beating him. Okay. All right. Cool. Um. Yeah, I'm gonna go with Tim Johnson though. I. I... I'm not a huge fan of either guy, if we're being completely honest. Um, I just think Tim Johnson has fought tougher guys. I think he's seen a lot more looks in general. And so I would just assume that at this weight class, especially with the experience, Tim Johnson would be able to get this one done. So I'm going to go with Tim Johnson here. Uh, and I think he uh, probably finds a chin here, and I would go at round one KO. Oh, baby. All right. All right, next on the list, our main event of this evening, Bellator 294, Liz Carmouche, the girl, Rilla, fighting Deanna, Vitamin D, Benet, ben Bennett, Benet? Bennett, Bennett. Bennett. <coughs> Liz Carmouche with 18 wins and seven losses, eight wins by KO, four by submission, and six by decision. Standing at 39 years old with a lot of wins back to back uh, as of 2020, uh, with a with a win, a, an introductory win into Bellator against uh, Deanna Bennett. P Bennett, the um, struggle is real. I know, dude. And two recent wins off of uh, championship fights off of Juliana Velasquez, both done very very beautifully. Uh, Deanna Bennett. Coming off of three wins in a row, two to Justine Kish. Uh, all decision wins as opposed to Carmouche's stoppages. Especially, she's got four stoppages in her five Bellator fights. Liz Carmouche is on some other shit right now. Um, I guess I'll go first here. I, I don't know what it is that Liz Carmouche has found, what sauce she is rolling with here, man, but... Liz Carmouche has found her groove. Um, I think she's she's found her comfort level in this division, in this in this organization. Um, I think she definitely gets treated like the champ here. She gets recognized as the champ here uh, from a respect standpoint, not just obviously visibly and, and by the organization, but I think from from the MMA community as well. Um, and her stoppages, man, have been nothing short of amazing. You know, we can argue that Juliana Velasquez won the first one all you want. You can't say dick about the second one at all. Uh, and uh, Deanna Bennett has an opportunity here to run back a fight that she lost years ago now at this point, three years to be exact, I guess two and a half really. Um, but I honestly think it's probably going to be worse than the first time. 
Um, she lost uh, via submission, rear naked choke in round three. And honestly, man, I, I think it's going to happen even sooner than that. I think Liz Carmouche has already fought her, already felt it, um, and probably is, is comfortable going into that fire again and finding an even better way to beat her this time around. So I'm going to go with Liz Carmouche. Uh, second round, ground and pound, TKO. So Carmouche is a big favorite. She is minus 500 to defend her belt. Deanna Bennett is plus 350. Um, this is one where I think there's simply levels, and I don't think Deanna Bennett is on a level with Liz Carmouche. Uh, as you said, they fought back in 2020. Liz beat her then. I understand Bennett is on a nice little run, but it's really only over two fighters since two of these in here were just Team Kish. And Liz, despite being 39 years old, is, as you said, looking friggin' fantastic. And she's really never stopped looking fantastic. Like, some of these fighters who end up in Bellator, they had a slide first. Like, there really wasn't a slide for Liz. She kind of just left the UFC when she was still whatever she was, top five-ish. Yeah. And she's picked up in, in Bellator. I think it's just that people maybe thought she was due to fall off because of the age, and it just hasn't happened. But we haven't seen anyone who can hang with her yet in Bellator, and I don't think Bennett is that woman. You know, she's older, too. She's 38 as well. Uh, UFC fans may remember her from the Nico Montano season of Tough. She was kind of the uh, quirky character on that season, a little bit of lesbianist things happening. Um, <laughs> and... Uh, I think that uh, Carmouche is just significantly better than her. I think she is in better physical shape, better cardio shape, and I don't really see an avenue to victory for Deanna Bennett. Uh, I Striking, I think she's outmatched. Wrestling, I think she's outmatched. I'm going to go with Liz. I could see it being ground and pound. I could see it being a sub. I agree with you. I like round two. I don't know which route I want to go. I'll say it's another sub, round two. Yeah, I think the real crazy thing about the career of Liz Carmouche is that if you watch her career in UFC, she's fought a lot of the best girls, a lot of the top of the of the division and, and, and of the of women's MMA, really, especially when it comes to 135. Um, but a lot of her, all of her wins, for the most part, are by decision. And she's always had these grueling, long yep. fights with a lot of these women, win or loss. And she gets to Bellator and she's wrecking these women yep. absolutely wrecking them that's uh, a great point and it's just it's just a different it's a different vibe from Liz Carmouche man it's it's a it's a fun it's a fun time man I've really enjoyed watching her I think more now in Bellator than I did in the UFC some of it might have to do with with motivation seems like Bellator was one of those places that really wanted to pay for Liz Carmouche when that time came and her contract was up and and it seems like that might have motivated her a little bit more because she came right in choked out Bennett Bennett, Jesus Christ, <laughs> choked out Bennett in her in her debut fight and went on from there to to, to finish four more people. Um, yep. I think it's been a great move for her, man, and, and I think a, a, a beautiful second half of her career for sure. Yep, well said. All right, we are done with you with Bellator two ninety four. That card is down, and we pick right up with <laughs> Bellator two ninety five on Saturday. Hafian Stats versus Patchy Mix. Uh, before we do a deep dive on the main card of this event, any fights you want to, or, or fighters you want to quickly just touch on before we go in there? Yeah, this one is deeper. Definitely an undercard worth watching on this one. Um, Bobby King's on the card, who's been solid in Bellator. He's fighting Alon Cruz. Keone Diggs and Weber Almeida should be a scrap. Um, Sumiko Unaba, who people kind of like, she's up and coming in Bellator. She'll get a shot against um, Veda Ardiega. And then you get a couple of the Hawaiian boys, Kai Kamaka and Yancey Medeiros, both on this card, fighting uh, Adley Edwards and Charlie Leary, respectively. So it'll be fun to see if they can get some wins in Hawaii. And then Mads Burnell on the undercard, too, who I get it. He's lost a couple in a row, but he had been looking very good. So definitely an undercard with some names worth checking out. Very nice. I had no idea. I totally forgot Yancey Medeiros was on this card. That's yep. fantastic. I wonder how he's doing. I wonder. I wonder how that that fight style is looking because I was a big Yancey Medeiros fan. That dude is a good time. I think he's only one fight in in Bellator, but he, I believe he won it. Let's confirm that. Yes, he he fought once and he won. He beat Emmanuel Sanchez, which is pretty solid. That Granted, he's a lot bigger man. than Emmanuel Sanchez. I think Sanchez came up for the sake of that fight, but still, still a good name. Yeah. 
All right, let's jump right into it. First on our main card here, Ray Borg versus Kyoji Haraguchi. Uh, Ray, the Taz Mexican Devil Borg, born in Albuquerque, New Mexico, with a record of 16 wins and five losses, 29 years old, one KO, six admissions, nine decisions. Uh, his most recent stint in MMA was in EFC, Eagle FC, the uh, promotion run and owned by Khabib Nurmagomedov. Uh, two decisions, very last one against Ricky Bandejas, as it was a split decision. Um, Ray Borg, kind of infamous for the issues with making the fight, making the weight, and all this other kind of stuff, um, has, has shown some inconsistencies in the past. I believe in EFC, he was still, he was pretty consistent, if I'm not mistaken. I don't, feel, I don't remember there being a lot of hullabaloo when it came to his shit in EFC. Um, yep. but, uh, but he is fighting Kyoji Horiguchi, which... Good luck with that. Uh, Kyoji Haraguchi, 32 years old, 31 wins, 5 losses, 15 wins by KO, 4 by submission, another 12 by decision. Kyoji Horiguchi with a resume that I can't properly explain to you. Has fought some of the best uh, in the UFC. Has fought Demetrius Johnson in a very hard-fought fight. Uh, Will go down as the fight with the I don't even know how to explain it. It was four four minutes and fifty nine seconds of the very last round where DJ was able to submit him via arm bar. So like the yes yes the the, the, the longest what is this? I don't even know how to explain what the record is. The latest that. the latest the finish latest. in a title fight. Yes, um, and has fought a, a variety of people since then. Fought for Risen, uh, Ryzen, Bellator. So Kyoji Horiguchi, no stranger to the game. Uh, an athlete, if nothing else, but he's a fantastic fighter as well. I think Ray Borg is about to get fucked up here. I'm going to be completely honest with you. Um, Ray Borg, I think the thing that makes Ray Borg successful in the fights that he takes is his wrestling. And I think it will do dick all against Kyoji Horiguchi. Kyoji Horiguchi's hips are fighters in and of themselves. Those things are not ones you can keep down and hold down without an extreme amount of effort or an extreme amount of technique. Both of which I think Ray Borg will be lacking compared to Kyoji Horiguchi. Um, the power, I think, is going to be on Kyoji Horiguchi's uh, side. And the speed, I think, will be stupidly outplaced compared to what Ray Borg is going to bring to the table. I, I, I think it's going to be a complete night and day difference when it comes to the speed specifically. Um, I think Kyoji eats here, man. I... I I think Ray Borg is tough, but I don't see this man going three rounds and just eating shot after shot after shot without wilting. So I'm going to go with the late stoppage here, but a stoppage nonetheless. Three uh, Round three, TKO, Kyoji Horiguchi. Okay, so Kyoji's the favorite. He's minus 250. Ray Borg is plus 190. This is a noteworthy fight because it is a flyweight fight happening in Bellator. So we will see what the plans end up being here. Obviously, flyweight is not a division that Bellator has had to this point. Um, you wonder if they're trying to set something up, try to let Horiguchi get some shine. There are certainly some flyweights out there in the world that they could look to sign if they do want to actually build a division here. Um, but it, it's good to see Horiguchi down at flyweight. And in looking at his resume that Omar was going through, I could be mistaken because there's maybe a guy on here that has fought at some different weights, but I think in all of Kyoji's fights, which is 36 fights, and he has five losses, I think only one of those losses has been at flyweight, which is Demetrius Johnson. I think the other four are all in fights at bantamweight where he was always undersized. So that is worth noting and, and illustrates how good of a flyweight this man is, which is absolutely his natural weight class. So he is going to be one inch taller than Borg and have a two-inch reach advantage. Uh, Ray Borg is good. I, I know he's had his ups and his downs. He certainly, as you said, had his weight issues at, at 125, so let's hope that he makes it. And yes, we did see Kyoji get controlled in his last Bellator fight by Apache Mix. But again, Apache Mix is a huge bantamweight. We are down at flyweight here, and I don't think Borg can do th the same type of things. It's, it's a much more size-friendly matchup for Kyoji. 
he will be faster. He's more powerful. And I think, as you said, he's too good for Ray Borg to control. The hips, everything that you already went into. I think that he will add up damage on Borg as this fight goes on. Torn between, if I want to say decision or, or kind of a late stoppage. Um, I guess I'll be different since you said late stoppage already. So I will say it's a decision win for Kyoji Horiguchi. I thought you were going to go round one, KO. I thought you were going to get crazy. No, no, no. All right. Uh, next on the list here, Aaron Pico versus James Gonzalez. Aaron Pico, the phenom here that everybody's hoping something will come of. Ten wins, four losses, uh, 26 years old. It's got seven wins by KO, two by submission, and one by decision. Recently lost his last fight. Uh, that was due to a shoulder injury. I'm pretty sure he threw a punch and out his shoulder went. They tried to pop it back in, did not work. So they called the fight. Um, up until that point, the man was on a six-fight win streak within Bellator. Uh, really seemed to have been finding his groove. Was, was knocking people out, choking people out. Uh, really having a lot of success inside of that cage. Uh, he will be fighting James Gonzalez, the alley cat. Uh, ten wins, uh, five losses, three by KO, two by submission, and five more by decision. James Gonzalez is 33 years old and coming off of Two wins, uh, his last one in the PFL against Vikas Singh Ruhil, which it's great. Um, <laughs> did I go first in the last one? Why don't you go first? Yeah, go ahead and did. take this one, uh, Pico and James Gonzalez. What are the odds here? So it's expectedly wide. Aaron Pico's minus 750, James Gonzalez is plus 500. Um, Gonzalez did look good in his one Bellator fight. He came in and beat up Cody Law, who's a guy that Bellator was kind of high on. Um, that said, I, I don't know that I understand why he is fighting Aaron Pico here. I, I get it that Pico was hurt, and maybe you want to ease him back in and try to let him get right back into the mix, but it kind of feels like an unnecessary risk and that it might have made more sense to go with someone a little more established in, in this spot and just trust that Pico could handle it. <coughs> um. But on that note, I, I I do think this should be all Aaron Pico. I, I think that he will probably get Gonzalez out of there in exciting fashion. So I'll, I'll I'll say he gets busy with the hands, puts it on Gonzalez, and and puts him down for good in round two. Aaron Pico, round two knockout. Nice. Yeah, dude, I, I trust Aaron Pico's hands a little too much here to, to, to go against him. Um, James Gonzalez just doesn't have the strength of the resume to really – have me thinking that he's going to do something here to Aaron Pico or present a real problem to Aaron Pico. On paper, Aaron Pico should have no problem here. I'm going to go with round one, KO. Nice. Okay. Uh, all right. On to our women's fight here. Alima Day, Alima Lay McFarlane, the eliminator. Oh, I see what she did there. Uh, fighting Kana Watanabe from Tokyo, Japan. Uh, Lima Lay McFarlane from San Diego, California. Uh, 12, 12 wins, two losses, two by KO, six by submission, and four more by decision. Uh, she is 33 years old. Her most recent fight is a win off of Bruna, El Bruna Ellen? Yep. Bruna Ellen. Uh, that was at UFC or Bellator 284. Uh, Kana Watanabe stands with 11 wins and one loss, one draw as well. Three wins by KO, four wins by submission, and four by decision. She's 34 years old, so close in age there. Uh, has a pretty strong record as far as wins are concerned uh, with one loss to Liz Carmouche, but her most recent win was to Denise Kielholtz, and that was at Bellator 281, winning by Triangle Choke. Um, I will go first here. I think the fight is very interesting. Um, I've never really had, I've never been super high on Alima Lee McFarlane. Um, I know she's a great personality and she seems like a fun addition to the roster, but like the, when it comes to the fight itself, I've never been super sold on her. Um, I think Watanabe, I think, is a bit more skilled overall, if we're being honest. She doesn't have the strength of resume, as far as I'm concerned, to 
you know, to really be that definitive of it. But, but you know, watching her fight, I do think that she has the skills to be able to take this on. Uh, so I'm going to go with uh, Watanabe here by TKO, and I'm going to do it round three. All right, so pretty tight odds. Watanabe is favored. She's minus 140. Alima Lay McFarlane is plus 115. Wow. And, yeah, I think she's been a bit hard to trust lately. She seems very hot and cold suddenly. A couple lackluster performances, specifically the one against Justine Kish. Um, obviously, she's the, the former champ in, in Bellator before she dropped the belt to Juliana Velasquez. Um she does get the hometown matchup in Hawaii. It's always fun watching her fight in Hawaii with her entrances and all that. So, you know, I'm sure she'd love to get the W here, but she's also already talking about kind of having one foot out the door, saying maybe she's going to do a couple more fights. Um, I don't love the vibes from her lately. And then on top of that, I think this is a tough matchup because I think Kana Watanabe is very good. I think she kind of got caught by Liz Carmouche, and maybe we didn't get to see the whole story the first time they that they fought. I think that she's probably the best flyweight in Bellator, aside from Liz Carmouche. Wow. Well, I mean, you know, if Watanabe wins here, maybe you'd love to see her and Juliana Velasquez actually settle that uh, as to who's the second best, but I, I like kind of Watanabe. I, I think she's good, and I think that she can ground Ali Malay and kind of control her and, and do work there. Uh, it's another one where I could see a finish come but I think I'll say decision for Kana Watanabe. Nice. All right. We have made the main event of this Bellator 295 card. Rafion Superstats versus Patrick Patchy Mix. Uh, Stats fighting out of Houston, Texas with 19 wins and one loss. Four wins by KO, four wins by decision, and 11 more by decision. He is 34 years old with recent wins over Danny Sabatello and Juan Archuleta, and even one against Magomed Magomedov, which you don't see very often. Uh, Apache Mix, fighting out of Angola, New York. 17 wins, one loss, one by KO, 12 by submission, and only four by decision in those 17 wins. 29 years old, and recently... Uh, recently took Rafion Stott's decision win over Magomed Magomedov and saw it, raised it, and finished Magomed Magomedov with a technical submission guillotine choke of round two in that fight recently, and then Kyoto Horiguchi before that, winning by unanimous decision, as we alluded to earlier. Um, Mark, why don't you go first? Give us the odds and your pick. What a good fucking fight, and I don't know what to do with myself. The odds barely know what to do with themselves either. Uh, Rafion Stotts is a slight favorite. He's minus 130. Patchy wow. Mix is plus 110. So it is very tight. Um, wow. It's four inches of height for Mix, but a one-inch reach advantage for Stotts. So despite the fact that Mix is going to be much taller, he does not have the reach. Granted, his legs could be in play. Um, man, I... I'm all over the place. I pre-tournament, you may remember, I picked Rafion Stotts. Um, well, I, that was before Sergio dropped out. I think I had said maybe I could see Sergio get through, but that my 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 other selection was, was Rafion Stotts. Maybe I even took him. I can't remember. I might have just taken him out right. But my, my point is I've been high on Rafion Stotts for a while here. He's been one of my guys. During the tournament, my eyes have been opened to how good Patchy Mix is. Like, he has looked incredible. I get it. He had a big size advantage on Horiguchi in the first fight, but he fucking dominated Kyoji Horiguchi. And then the second fight, he handled Magomed Magomedov, which I was not expecting to see. I thought maybe he could beat him, but not handle him the way that he handled him. So coming off of that fight, I started to be like, shit, I think I'm ready to go all in on Patchy Mix. And now the fight's here, and I'm like, mm, I really like Ralphie on Stotts. Like, I don't, I'm just, I'm, I'm all over the place. They're both so good. They have both look good in this tournament. I guess Stotts didn't exactly look thrilling against Danny Sabatello in his last fight, but it's it was a really tricky matchup, and he navigated it, got it done. Um, I don't know. It, it's, it's very hard. Patchy Mix has lost one time in his life, which was to Juan Archuleta back in 2020. He has notably improved his game since that time, especially on the feet. He's so much more comfortable. Um... Rafion Stotts has also only lost one time, which is to Marab, as we always mention. 
He has he beat Juan Archuleta to start this tournament, which is the guy who has a win over Mix, as I just said. I really think they're both super high level. I think they both do well in the UFC as bantamweights. Um, no result would really surprise me here. It's possible that Mix has really reached a point where he is just not deterrable. Like, that's honestly the vibes this man is giving off. But I think I am just finding myself not being able to look past the wrestling and scramble ability of Raphael Stotts until I see someone overcome it. So I think I'm just going to lean that Stotts can escape enough and, and stuff at times and scramble at times and do what he needs to do to not get out grappled and that on the feet he can edge things and, and does carry the bigger power there. So I could see it be another close decision like, like his last one was, but I'm going to go with Raphael Stotts to, to win a UD and, and win this tournament. It's very, very hard to make your game work against Raphael Stotts. He's just, he's a difficult defensive puzzle. And, and I will say that's, that's the difference. Yeah. I don't disagree. Um, I think the, the thing that, gives me pause about picking Rafael on Stotts is the fact that Mix seems to have, uh, again, kind of seems to have found his groove, right? He seems to have found kind of how his game really works and, and what the most efficient way to, to, to use his game. And his top pressure is fucking dumb. Like his, his ability, once he gets on the ground, if he gets you on the ground, he's one of those guys where I would probably say, I don't care how good your hips are. Patchy Mix is, is probably going to keep you on the ground. And Rafael Stas is known for being scrambly, known for being the guy that doesn't really accept uh, being taken down or being kept on the ground. I just think that if Patchy Mix gets him down there, I don't think it'll matter, man. I, I think he's so, so strong down there. And you combine that with the technique he seems to have in the Brazilian jiu-jitsu world where he's not wrestling, right? Like Brazilian jiu-jitsu guys, that sometimes their approach to the ground game is very different than a wrestler's approach to the ground game. And a lot of times in jiu-jitsu, a lot of it is just sticking close. White on rice, keeping your hips tucked in, everything kind of – that center of gravity you wanted as, as low and as close as humanly possible so that all that weight is in one area and not spread out and, and, and easy to maneuver and, and reverse and so on and so forth. And I think Patriki can do that without thinking. Um, I think a lot of those skills are probably not second Patricky. nature to him. He's not Brazilian, just Patrick. Is it just Patrick? Yeah, patchy is maybe what's in your brain. Patchy, yes. Yes. Uh. Yes, that is what it is. <laughs> um, but yeah, man, I, I think uh, I think he, he takes this one. I do think that he's very, very good. I'm going to go out on a limb here. Rafael Stotts has never been stopped in his career. But I think he's going to get stopped here. I think Mix takes a submission here late in the fight, round three. Wow. Wow. Well, he's been stopped, but not subbed. Marab Has knocked he been him out. Marab, the one loss. Marab knocked him out. Oh, I thought it was. I saw a decision here. It was, you know, uh, it was a knockout. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I love it. I love that we're on opposite sides because the I feel like the fight deserves us being on opposite sides. It, it's a great, it's a great fight. Great fight. Yeah, and one of us will look smart right. next week. <laughs> and it's dope, right, too, man. because it's like there's so much happening at Bantamweight. You have this fight to get this the tournament winner here who will be the interim champ because Stotts currently holds that interim belt. And then you have Sergio Pettis returning, fighting fucking Pitbull. And then the winners of these two things, I guess, are going to match up against each other. So it's it's almost like the tournament continues. Bro, imagine, like, the world we live in now is now Sergio Pettis fighting Pitbull. Yeah. <laughs> For a belt. Yep. Like. Yep. It's crazy. It's come so far. It's so crazy. Yep. All right, man. Uh, we have finished our Bellator recaps, both of Bellator 294 and Bellator 295, again, Friday and Saturday, respectively. And now we are jumping into UFC Fight Night, Pavlovich versus Blades. Uh, <clears throat> this fight card from top to bottom is actually quite Quite nice. Uh, it is a very low key uh, banger of a card. Not a ton of hype behind it, but 
every single fight in here has something to look forward to. So we are going to quickly run through this card almost as if it was a lightning round of sorts uh, and just kind of highlight fights as we go up. And then we will get into a couple of the more serious fights uh, once we get into the second, the later half of the card here. Uh, so we'll go back and forth uh, one for one and uh, we'll exchange thoughts and picks and uh, and we'll go from there. So Good. let's start here. Mark, why don't you start with us first here? Brady Highstand uh, fighting Batchel Dana Bantamweight fight. Who are you picking? I like Brady Highstand. I liked him on Tough. I've been high on him. I kind of think he's a little too easy to hit to get past someone who hits as hard as Dana does right now. So I will go Batgirl Dana round two knockout. Very nice. Uh, I like he Stan too. Um, I think he's 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 a very determined kid. You can see that he has a lot of fight back in him. I do think Dana hits very very hard, and I do think he will get tagged. But I think I think he Stan has a chin, and I think he can make the adjustments. So I'll go with he Stan uh, by unanimous decision. I think he can take two out of the three. Nice. All right, I'll cue you up now. So we're taking turns. Next fight. Priscilla Cachuera versus Karini Silva. I, uh, I like Cachuera. Uh, flyweight, I want to say. Flyweight, yes. Yes. No, you get there. Uh, I like Cachuera here, man. Um, she's not always the most technical fighter in there, but the woman is a brawler. She's a, she's a, a scrapper for sure. Karine uh, is a little bit more of a killer, I would say. Um, it's got a ton of finishes one way or the other. Uh, but I think uh, I think I'm going to say Cachoeira here, man. I, I think it's going to be a real crazy fight, and I think overall these girls are going to try to finish each other. But in the end, I think it'll go to decision. So I'm going to go with Cachoeira by unanimous decision. I've been high on Karini Silva in, in her couple fights so far. She her jits is just so filthy. Um, it's giving me pause that Kachwari looks like such a beast lately. She's rolling. She's won four or five. It definitely seems like she has found a groove for herself and, and found how she needs to fight. But I'm I'm going to stick with what I have seen in, in Silva and, and trust that and say that she can tap Kachwari here. So I will say round two sub for Silva. Very nice. All right. Uh, Francis Fire Marshall. Versus William Gomis. Uh, go Oof. ahead and get us going, Mark. What? So featherweight fight here. Um, both of these guys in their second fight in the UFC. Both guys are 1-0, I believe. Am I right on that? Is Francis Marshall 1-0? Yes, he is. Um, yeah, yeah both, both won their debuts. Uh, Marshall was in kind of more impressive fashion. Gomis was a, was a split, if I recall, or a majority, something like that. Majority. But I like him. I, I remember... Um, the card he debuted on, it was that French card with, with Ghana to Ivasa. And I remember being intrigued by his talent. I'm going to roll with him to be a bit more well-rounded, bit slicker and win a UD over Francis Marshall. Yeah. I really like Francis Marshall, man. I, I, I remember him uh, from the contender series and having sort of a, a story about being a firefighter, kind of very similar to the whole Stipe thing. Um, so I'm going to roll with Francis Marshall here. I do think that Gomez is very good. Um, he was a very technical fighter when we saw him on the Gon card. Um, but I, I'm i going to roll with the wrestling of Francis Marshall and the striking that he has as well. So I'll go with Francis Marshall by unanimous decision. Nice. Next one, at heavyweight. Uh, the return of the heavyweight tough winner recently, uh, the brother of Kamaru Usman, Muhammad Usman. And he will be fighting the brother of Justin Taffa in the UFC, which is Junior Taffa. So, Muhammad Usman and Junior Taffa. I still need to see these two men in the same room. Together. <laughs> like, Junior Taffa and Justin Taffa look exactly alike. So I, do, I still need to see them in the same room. Together. Um, I don't really know much about Junior Taffa, man. I, I haven't seen any of his performances. I should have looked up the, the, the Risen fight that's probably online somewhere. Um, but much to the family name, he's knocking dudes out left and right. Um, you know, Muhammad Usman f having won the ultimate fighter is 
still very far, in my opinion, from being that dude. Um, I'm not completely sold on him and his approach. I think uh, a, a lot of the guys they got for that heavyweight division of the Ultimate Fighter, I don't want to. I don't want to be a dick, but I don't think they were very good. Um, I think trying to find really elite and really good heavyweights right now is is very difficult thing to do, which is why we have guys like Pavlovich surging up the goddamn heavyweight rankings because there's like no one else. Um, so with that in mind, I, I'm not completely sold on Usman. I know he has a game. I know he has a game plan. I know he has a route that he goes for victory. Um, but I'm going to go with, with the younger kid here, man. Uh, I, I'm going to take the, the Mike approach. I'm going to go with the 26-year-old. Uh, I'm going to roll with somebody who I think is going to be more aggressive. I think who's going to want to fight more. If there's one thing I took away from the uh, Muhammad Usman tenure that we've seen so far is the man shies away pretty badly from getting hit. Um, and in the heavyweight division, having that kind of reaction to shots is going to get you hit. So I think if Tafa puts hands on him, I think he goes down like a sack of shit. So I'm going to go with Junior Tafa, first round KO. So to make you feel even better about your point, there is a wealth of kickboxing experience behind Junior Tafa. Um, oh, let's go. Okay. So, yeah, the... The comfort level of Muhammad Usman and the striking is not my favorite. I don't think that he is any great wrestler where he can 100% lean on that. Is it possible? I guess. I don't know quite what Tafa's takedown D looks like. But if he has some of it, I think that this is probably going to go badly for Usman. So I will say Junior Tafa, round two knockout. Dog, are they the same size, though? Like, it says Muhammad Usman is around 237 and Tafa walks around at 240. Like, that's crazy. I feel like Usman is a gigantic human being. Yeah, I feel, I th- kind of thought he was bigger than that, too. That's hey. interesting. Yeah. Huh. I wonder what he weighs in at, then. I, I'm going to take a closer look at that this upcoming weekend, because I'm curious to see what Usman is, is weighing in at these days. Yeah. All right. Um, <clears throat> your turn. Yeah, your turn. your turn to Q. Very good. All right. Next on the list, we have a featherweight fight, the elusive women's featherweight division has shown its head again with our girl norma dumont fighting carol rosa uh we'll go for it mark where do you think this fight's going yeah so um rosa moves up here i forget if it's rosa or hosa might be hosa but uh either way steps up here to to take a featherweight fight to give norma dumont something to do since she just kind of chills there as the only featherweight there is at this point in time. Um, so, yeah, Carol Hosa is, um, I want to say she might still be ranked top 10 at women's bantamweight. She's looked pretty solid. I like Dumont. She's an effective game. She has turned back similarly ranked girls to um, Hosa. She beat Macy Chasson. She beat Aspen Ladd, if I recall. Yeah. Um, but I, I think Hosa might have the right game to get it done. I think... She is a similar level of striker and that she can probably lean on the wrestling and, and maybe steal it that way. I don't – Dumont's tough, and she's got size, and maybe she's not going to be so easy to take down, but I'm I'm torn on it, and I will lean toward the wrestling as the differentiator here. So I, I'll go Carojo CUD. I'm going to roll with my girl, Norma Dumont. I thought you would. You know I will. Norman Dumont's only got two losses to Macy Chasson and Megan Anderson. Oh, she Megan lost Anderson, Macy? Oh. She did. Uh, Megan Anderson is like seven feet tall. I don't know who's trying to get away from those limbs. Um, Megan put her out, though, but, but that's neither here nor there. Right. I um, that one. I think Norma Norma's, – Norma's a decent fighter, man. I think she's got good, solid fundamentals. You know, she's she's not a flashy fighter. She's not a highlight reel fighter in any stretch of the imagination. But she is a worker, and she is somebody who goes in there and scraps. Um, she is single-handedly keeping the 145 division alive. The girl is fighting like two, three times a year at this point. Uh, all at 145 for the most part. And, and I think she does it again, man. She's coming off of a win off of Danielle Wolf, a decision win. And I think she's going to get another one under her belt as well. So I'm going to go with Dumont by unanimous decision. Nice. Um, okay, next one, we move to the bantamweight division. 
for the size mismatch of the card, which is uh, Ronnie Yaya against Montel Jackson. So you explain to me when Ronnie Yaya isn't at a size disadvantage. Well, I mean, sure. He is a Montel Jackson human. is huge. For reference, Montel is four inches taller and is going to have a seven and a half inch reach advantage. I wonder what he's supposed to walk at because he looks like he cuts a good amount of weight. That man is, there's no fat on him at all. No, not much. Um, I like Hani Yaya. I've, I've, I've been a fan of his for a while. That how, When did this kid make his debut? 2011, dog. Ages when, ago, they were, yeah. when they were still doing Fighting for the Troops, those Fight for the Troop events. And he was a WEC name before that. That's like, true. We've, no, we've known him since WEC. 2008, if we include WEC. There you oh, go. No, 2007 was his there WEC you. debut. There you go. Dude. I mean, he's been around for a long time. Inconsistent a little bit here and there, but usually goes on a little bit of a run before he ends up losing. So he'll go three and then lose one and then another four and then lose a couple. Um, but he's a problem, man. And his jits is, is pretty nasty. His ability to submit is really, really good. Um, crazy thing is he's got 28 wins, 10 losses, but he's got no KOs on his record. All of his wins are by submission. That dude, or most of his wins are by submission. 21 submissions and seven uh, decisions. One draw, one no contest, but that doesn't matter. So, um, Montel Jackson, like you said, is, is a gigantic human being as well. Up and comer. Um, his last fight against Julio Arce was a great fight and a great accounting of kind of where he's at and the skills that he brings to the table. Um, I thought that was a close fight, a very, uh, a very well contested fight. Uh, but I thought he did win that fight. If I remember right, I, I see Hani Yaya having some success in this fight, but I think Monsell Jackson is going to end up taking this one in the end. Uh, I see Hani Yaya having success early in round one, but I think by two and three, Monsell Jackson takes over. So I'm going to go with Jackson by unanimous decision. I think this one could be bad. I think that the size is a big factor. I kind of think they want Ronnie to lose. He kind of is like this old dude that just doesn't go away. Um, I think Jackson's too big. He's a good wrestler, so I'm not sure what kind of suggest what kind of success Ronnie has in taking him down. So uh I, I think it could end up getting ugly. I, I will say that he will knock out Ronnie Yaya in I'll say round two just because Yaya's tough. Dog, um, when was the last time Hani Yaya had a relevant win? Like never. Yeah he he beats a lot of random names. That's that's for sure. Literally, the first one that, that really pulls up that strikes the eye is Mike Brown. In 2011, yeah, just I'm looking what at it, too. What the fuck? Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. For all the winning that Hani Yaya does, none of it actually means anything. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Wow. <clears throat> all, right. all right. Let's keep uh, rolling. Keep rolling. It's getting late. Next fight. Um, Wait. No, your turn. It's my turn. Yeah. Ricky Glenn versus Christos Giagos. Mark, go ahead. Okay, lightweight fight here. Um, Yagos is a guy who who is always tough. I, I don't think he's an easy guy to beat by, by any means. He Even in his losses, he tends to give dudes battles. But I do think Ricky Glenn is better. Um, the performance he had against Grant Dawson, I feel like, really showed a lot of how good he is. And even back when he was at featherweight, the, the performance he had against Gavin Tucker... There's just when Glenn is on, he, he is on. So I, I'm going to go with him here. I think he's he's just tougher, a bit more of a dog. I, I will say Ricky Glenn UD. Yeah, I think both of these guys are, are pretty inconsistent. I think that's what makes this fight difficult to pick. Um, I think on any given day, both of these guys have the ability both to win and it, probably the same amount of percentage to lose. Um, I'll go with Ricky Glenn just based off of the strength of the – of the resume, um, based off of some of the wins, even some of the losses that he's had as well. Uh, even a win over Dennis Bermudez back in 2018, split wouldn't, but a hard fought fight for sure. Um, I, I think he does well here. I think it's probably going to be a very close contested fight. Um, I wouldn't be surprised to see a split decision. So I will go Glenn by split. Nice. Um, 
Okay, moving on, we, we cross over to the main card. So we're only doing big previews of three fights here, just as you guys have noticed, if you've been watching this whole episode, there were a million things to do this episode. We're still trying to get to the boxing, so a couple of these main cards are going to be in our quick previews as well. First one is at welterweight, uh, Jeremiah Wells versus Matt Semmelsberger. Who falls down first? You know, Matt Semmelsberger is a very unassuming guy because I, I feel like when you look at him, even when you look at the way he fights, you don't really take much away from it visually, but he's effective. And his strikes look like they suck. Um, I, I, you know, Jeremiah Wells is probably, from a visual standpoint, the guy that looks better, right? The guy that looks more impressive. Visually, he looks like the more uh, 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 physically imposing person. Has gotten the KOs, got the knockout, got the you know got the submission wins, um, but Semmelsberger is a sneaky little bastard, and every time you think you've got him pegged, he comes right back and he and he wins somehow. Um, with all that being said, I'm still going to pick against him. I'm going to go with Jeremiah Wells, and I'm going to go with round. I'm going to go with unanimous decision. I'm going to go with unanimous decision. So Jeremiah Wells has looked really good in the UFC thus far. He um he hasn't beat like a a big deal name quite yet. Um, obviously like a vet in Court McGee, guys like that. Semmelsberger is, is definitely at a higher level than him at this point. I do think this could absolutely go either way. Both guys carry big power. Um, not even sure who I think carries the bigger power. I guess we're gonna we're gonna find out. But by law. I have to go with Matt Semmelsberger because I fucking love Jake Matthews and he somehow just beat Jake Matthews, which I didn't see coming in a million years. So I now have to pledge my allegiance to Matt Semmelsberger and ride with him. So I will say that he wins this fight. Um, I will say it's a round two, late round two TKO for Matt Semmelsberger. Yeah, no, no. Uh, you're I need up. Jake Matthews to get that one back because that's bullshit. Yeah, I still can't. I don't understand it, but yeah. Uh, all right. Do you want to give you this one? Because I really want this one. <laughs> uh, Yasmin Lucindo moves up to uh women's flyweight after debuting at women's strawweight to take on the tough runner-up Brogan Walker. I am a huge fan of Lucindo off of the one fight I saw against her and Yasmin Hadegui where they both debuted together at the same time on the main card of uh, Vera Cruz back in uh, August of, of 2022. Um, th- scrapper. Th- I mean, this girl's hands are fucking crazy. They're, they're absolutely ridiculous. Both of them were uh, uh, Hadegui's as well. If you guys have been listening to the podcast for a while... Um, I've been high on Hadagui even since that fight as well. I think she's had at least one fight since then, right? Just yep. one. Yep, one. Um, and she looked fucking nasty in that one too and knocked that girl out. I Arguably, I think uh, Ismail Lucindo and Yasmin Hadagui, I think they arguably probably had their, their hardest fights getting into the UFC against each other than they probably will going forward in this division. Um, I think Lucindo eats Brogan Walker alive. I'm going to be completely honest with you. Um, Brogan Walker is a, is, is a good fighter. Um, she is a dog for sure. That is definitely a girl that doesn't quit on herself and definitely tries to walk through the fire if she can, but she lacks a lot of different things, especially in the striking department. And I just think Lucindo is way too tuned up, way too zoned in to allow Walker to, to walk out of there. No pun intended without major damage. Uh, so I'm going to go with Lucindo by second round TKO. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I too was impressed with Lucindo in her debut. I kind of am starting to feel like we may have been fooled a little bit about how good Brogan Walker was from what we watched on Tough. I really did not love what I saw from her in the finale. Um against uh, Juju Miller. And then we've now seen Juju Miller get pretty much worked um, by Veronica Hardy. So I'm not super high on Brogan Walker right now. We'll see. It's only been one fight, so maybe she she comes out looking much different and um, 
I'll have to change my tune here, but I, I'm also going to roll with Lucindo. I will say a UD win for her. Nice. All, All right. right. We've made it to the real previews. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, let's jump right into just a little bit more detailed previews here, starting off with Bobby Green versus Jared Gordon. Mark, go ahead and go first. All right, so Bobby Green is the favorite here. He's minus 260. Jared Gordon is plus 210. There is one inch of height and three inches of reach on the side of Bobby Green. Um, I got it wrong in Bobby Green's last fight. I picked him over Drew Dober. Really thought he could get that done. Obviously, he got dropped pretty badly, but I am ready to ride with him again here and even more confidently than I was in that one. I just... I don't know. I've said it before on this show. I've never been a huge Jared Gordon guy. I get it that he kind of keeps doing well. A lot of, obviously, a lot of people thought he'd be Patty. I don't think he can hang with Bobby Green on the feet. I, I think Bobby can really play his game in, in the striking here and, and pick Gordon apart. I don't think Gordon possesses the level of wrestling necessary to be able to take the fight over that way. He has some, but Bobby's takedown D and his getup ability is generally pretty good. So I think we end up seeing a typical Bobby Green fight. You know, hands down, Gordon whiffing a lot, Green kind of playing with him, Green peppering and, and getting back on track. So I'm going to go Bobby Green, UD in style. 100% agree. Um, I, I won't repeat a lot of things you just said, but I do think that Gordon is not going to be able to do anything significant in any area of the fight. I think Bobby Green is better everywhere. Um, I don't really trust Gordon's wrestling. I think we saw the difficulty he got against Patty Pimlet, who is kind of known for not really having the best takedown defense, <coughs> and Gordon was barely able to do anything with it. Bobby Green is is much more complicated to take down, even more complicated to hold down, um, and he will talk shit to you, and he will continue to hit you from the bottom all at the same time. Um, I think Bobby Green is just overall a better fighter. Definitely more experience. He's got his losses. Those losses, though, come from scraps. A lot of the time, these guys are getting into some real shit um, and getting on the wrong side of these these unanimous decisions. But at no point have I ever watched a Bobby Green fight, maybe with the exception of the Islam Mahachev fight, as things tend to go, where I felt like Bobby Green didn't deserve to be in there and didn't deserve to be, you know, getting the the, the fighting recognition that he deserves. So I'm going to go with Bobby Green here. Uh, I also think he is going to go uh, unanimous decision. I don't think he ends up putting Gordon out, but I do think he styles on him for three rounds. All right, we're in the same boat there. I'll cue you up for this one. Um, we get to the newly minted co-main. As we mentioned, Ricky Simone and Yudong Song were on this card. Got bumped one week. They're going to main event next week. So the new co-main is going to be a middleweight fight between Brad Tavares, longtime UFC uh, mainstay, kind of in the gatekeeper role these days, taking on Bruno Silva, a man who had some hype and has fallen on a, a little bit of a hard times as of late. Where are you going in this one? This is such a difficult fight, man, because both of these guys are in such weird positions, right? Like, Bruno Silva is the kind of guy where Skill for skill, I th I think I would pick him over Brad Tavares. I think he's a very good fighter. Um, I think he's crazy strong. He throws with such power. Um, but he has dropped the last two. And, and you know, he didn't look great against the Al – well, he, he did look good against the Alex against Alex Pereira. Oh, that one, when, yeah. Uh, they were saying especially the knowing – no, especially knowing now what we know about Alex Pereira and how good he is in the striking and things like that. Um, but he also lost against Gerald Merchett in a uh, – uh, via submission gu uh, guillotine choke so and he looked awful he didn't look great he did not look great but brad tavares is one of those guys that's also inconsistent um brad tavares could look really good until he's just not and that's kind of unfortunately the story of a lot of the performances that don't go his way is he'll look good until he doesn't and I feel like this is one of those performances where it might just go that way. So I'm getting that feeling. I'm going to end up going Bruno Silva. I will go Silva by unanimous decision. I think Tavares takes probably the first round or two. Uh, first round, a little bit of the second, but I think Silva picks up, takes the second and the third. 
All right, so fairly close. Tavares is a minus 165 favorite. Bruno Silva is plus 130 as the other dog, underdog. Um, I, I don't know. It's a tough one. I was really high on Bruno Silva at one point. Not high to the point that I thought he could be like a champion, but that I thought he was a surefire, you know, ranked contender type of guy on the come up. Um, even when he lost to Alex Pereira, I thought that he had a very good showing of himself close fight, hung with him in the striking. And then the Gerald Mearshard fight happened and he looked like, um, the fucking monsters. I couldn't remember what they were called in space jam when they lose their powers or the, or sorry, the, I guess it was the basketball players. This analogy just got fucked, but you know what I mean? It looked like his powers were just gone. Like I, I didn't know what I was watching. I was super confused. Um, and Brad Tavares, if nothing else is a really good gatekeeper. Like, you know, you take away um, the, what is his name? You take away the he head kick loss to Edmund Shabazian that he had. And other than that loss, his only losses in any recent years are Robert Whitaker, Izzy, and Drikas Duplessis. So, Brad Tavares, you got to be pretty good to get to get past that dude. Um, and there's definitely the potential that Bruno Silva possesses the skills to do that, but I'm just so baffled by what I watched in his last performance that I don't feel comfortable enough picking it until I see him look like the guy I had been watching prior to that. So I got to stay off him for, for at least one fight here. And, um, and I do like Brad Tavares. He, he's really good, man. He's really technical. He could win this just by virtue of being too difficult for Silva to win enough exchanges against. And I'll say Tavares wins a competitive UD. Nice. All right, man. We have made it. Main event time. Curtis Blades versus Sergey Pavlovich. Heavyweight time. Up and comer Sergey Pavlovich fighting the established Curtis Blades. Uh, Mark, go first and tell us what you think. All right. I'm shooting a text to Tommy so he knows it is almost time for the boxing. Um, okay. So, yeah, fucking huge main event here. Um, very possible that the winner of this main event is going to be fighting the winner of Bones and Stipe, assuming Bones and Stipe is ever happening. Um, probably likely that that's what happens to, to the winner here. So huge main event, huge implications. Uh, the favorite, who do you think the favorite is? Uh, if it were me picking, I'm uh, Pavlovich I think would be the favorite. Curtis Blades, minus 170. Wow. Good for Sergei, him, though. Sergey Pavlovich, plus 140. So, obviously, people have questions about the wrestling of Pavlovich. Um, he, I believe they're the same exact height, but Pavlovich will have a four-inch reach advantage, which I do think is a factor. I, look, I, Curtis Blades is very good. I think with the power and accuracy that Sergey Pavlovich possesses, it's really hard to pick against him when he's standing across from a guy that we know can be chin-checked. We've seen it before. And yes, blade striking has been improving tremendously. He just got a knockout recently where he, where he looked great. Yes, he's an elite wrestler, and we don't know what Pavlovich's takedown D or bottom game necessarily look like at all. <clears throat> But, God, all he's got to do is land one. And I know that's a bullshit saying and all that. But it's true when we're talking about Sergey Pavlovich. Like, it's scary, scary power. Everyone he has landed on has melted. Everything he throws seems to land on the button. He has four inches of reach, which is a lot. And and Curtis Blades, we know, does not react well to to big power. Plus, he, as I kind of mentioned, he is striking a lot more lately. And you never know how dumb guys are going to fight. So... He better be 100% wrestling in, in this fight because if he plays around on the feet, then I'm even more comp- confident in Pavlovich. you got to hope Blades is coming in here looking to be a wrestler. Um, so who knows? We, it, it's absolutely a question mark what the defensive wrestling of Sergey Pavlovich looks like. And with a guy as good, at Blade, as, good as Blades, um, nothing would surprise me here. But I've just seen him be too afraid of power coming back at him too many times. He just kind of, 
He gets a little tentative. He'll get frozen at times because he wants to make sure he's not getting caught, and then he gets caught. So I will go with a round two knockout for Sergei Pavlovich. I like it. I have been pretty high on Pavlovich for a while now. I, I, you know, we talked about the accuracy. We talked about the power. But it's also his calmness in there and kind of his comfort level uh, inside of the octagon. And you see a lot of guys kind of, you know, he, he, I think he fucked up against Al, Alistair Overeem for that reason where, you know, debut fight. I think it was short notice at that, and it's Alistair Overeem. Um, but he's come back, and he has been wrecking dudes left and right. He hasn't come out of the first round in his UFC tenure at all. And I think he keeps that streak going, man. Curtis Blades is a good fighter, no doubt. Uh, he's an even better wrestler, I think, but is heavyweight. And you really don't need much. And once guys are really technical at heavyweight, these long, prolonged wars generally don't tend to happen. Um, you know, maybe once we get to the very elite, the tippy tippity top, where the guys are so good, they're barely hitting each other and maybe getting a couple shots off here and there. But for the most part, a lot of these guys here tend to put hand on chin and they're going to sleep. Pavlovich, to me, is that guy, and that's what he's going to be looking for. Curtis Blaze, I don't think he's going to be looking to put hands on chin. I think he's going to be looking for a complete performance where there are takedowns involved, and they, and then, you know, and that's fine. I think that's the way he needs to go. But if Pavlovich <laughs> is able to put hands on Curtis Blade's chin, any part of it, Curtis Blades is going down. Uh, I am very, very reliant, or I'm very, very confident that uh, Pavlovich can do that i think it's a big spot for him i think this is his breakout here even having fought uh derrick lewis and taito ivasa already and beating them in crazy fashion i think this is the one that really is going to set him apart round one ko pavlovich we will see it would be it would be quite a statement if he goes out there and in the first you know five or ten minutes knocks blades out cold and you and you're looking at that guy saying that's who john jones may end up with next how do you not be a big billing big billing worst case scenario he fights Cyril Gan as an interim not not an interim belt but like a you know in the interim yeah if if things get a little weird with the booking of of Jones and Stipe but right. Pavlovich is right there man and I don't really see him going away anytime soon yeah nope me neither we will see all right all right baby. we did it we did it we are done with Bellator we are done with UFC and we are now on to a little mm, boxing. <laughs> All uh, right, so we I, are getting uh, Tommy. I just told Tommy to join, so right give here. him a minute to connect here. But yeah, we um, when we have big fights in boxing, we've done this a couple times before. Um, I know we did it for Fury and Wilder. I believe there was one other where we have done this as well. Oh, it was the um, the women's fight. Um, Katie Taylor. Oh, yeah. When she Serrano. fought, um, yes, Amanda, Amanda Serrano. Serrano. Thank you. Um, and now we will do it again. We have uh, we have Tank Davis, Gervonta Tank Davis, and Ryan Garcia this weekend, one of the biggest fights we have had in boxing for a while. So it is only right to have Tommy back on. He is always our go-to when it comes to the boxing. So, uh, yeah, going to do a little boxing segment on the MMA show here. So, Oh, dog. I didn't even know. I didn't even realize Gabriel Rosado was also on this card. Yeah, I, I didn't realize that either until today. Shows you how much we're just stuck in the MMA world, but I'm sure Tommy will fill us in. And there he is, right on cue. So I, yes. gave, a little, I gave a little brief intro while we were waiting for you, but uh, yeah, welcome in Tommy O'Neill, my cousin. He's a very lucky guy to be related to me. Uh, the host of Unboxing. If you haven't heard him on here before, he always brings the energy, brings the comedy, the absurdity. And uh, yeah, no Mike, but you, you're the new third man this week. Wait, yeah, wait. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm here. I'm here. Uh, I'm, I'm, I am the third man. I am Mike. I am a professional ring announcer. Um, that's just, that's a joke. I'm actually not. But I think I do have a pretty sultry voice and uh, I do run a boxing podcast. So uh, good in good company here with the MMA crowd. Yes, sir. Hopefully. Yes. yes. We will, Shout out we will, to uh, boxing. We will tag it, but go check out Unboxing if you are listening here and you like what you hear. Tommy is constantly pumping out videos and shorts and everything of that nature for, for every card. 
and, he, and he's killing it with the, uh, the picks as well, trying to win you some money, so it's worth checking out for sure. Very nice. Absolutely. So anyway, huge card coming up. So uh, I will let you intro this card. Tell us what is going down this weekend. So absolutely. This is – so I do want to start by saying that, you know, boxing has had a good year. When I'm on this show, I always try to really – Give a, good, uh, give a good impression of boxing to the MMA fans because if you just put your eyeballs on the sport, I guarantee you'd see what you like, you know. You, you, you'll like it. Um, but, yeah, we've had a good year so far. We had the Caleb Plant Benavidez card. We had, we, had, uh, we had good stuff coming up. We might get Spence Crawford, but that's been like the last three years. So we'll see you guys, okay. But um, we are getting, you know, Ryan Garcia versus Javante Davis. And the thing is, is that... Um, I'm sure maybe you two should be definitely familiar with this, but maybe some of you don't know, you know, in the 80s, uh, you know, boxing was absolutely on fire. And we had something uh, in, in the lightweight division uh, called the Four Kings. Actually, I believe they were welterweights, but called the Four Kings. And in this lightweight division today, we call them the Four Princes because they are uh, really great. And there's been even more names added onto there, like Teofimo Lopez, George Cambosis. But we had Lomachenko. You know, we we had Ryan Garcia and 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 Gervonta Davis. We had all these names, and we're getting two of them to fight each other. So this is really, really a big deal. And this is something that does seldom happen in boxing. Um, before I pitch it back to you guys, but I want to say the most important thing about this fight, you guys, is that if we, we get this fight, I guarantee you, first off, that this fight is very good, goes over very well, um, and to bore you guys to death and talk about numbers, I am sure that this fight absolutely crushes it in pay-per-view buys. Um, you know, the UFC, by no doubt, no, no question, man, is a more popular sport these days. It's very purposeful that they're giving you a card that's not exactly trying to go up against this thing. Um, I believe that this does very well, and, and I really have good hopes. I'm trying to stay positive. I have good hopes that this shows other fighters um, that this is, this is, you can get money this way. We don't have to follow the modern day business model of boxing where we get, you know, uh, you, you're fighting the guy who, who drove you to the fight and the, your cab driver, you know, <laughs> and, and that they, they'll pay you. And that's been the way it works. And then it's low risk and you don't get as much reward, but you get the reward. This should show that there's huge reward. And even for some fighters, more importantly than that, huge eyeballs and, and fame to be had in making these things. And, I think that these guys put on a hell of a performance and uh, and that the loser can hold his head up high and won't be done in boxing. Imagine that. Imagine boxing having great fights and it's okay if you lose to the very best. Imagine that. Well, I can tell yeah. you this. There's one thing that I've seen pretty consistently leading up to this fight, which I will say they've done a much better job promoting this boxing event than I think they have any other in recent memory. And that includes a lot of the Canelo fights and things like that. Um, but... Ryan Garcia and, and Tank are talking wild shit to each other back and forth. And if we've, I don't really think we see that that much, you know, in boxing. We see it every now and again in MMA when you get a guy who can talk pretty well. But, I mean, the, the where these two guys come from, I feel like, is so different. And the way that they talk shit to each other is so different. And yet, almost equally disrespectful in ways. <laughs> um and they've now gotten to the point where they're talking about putting up their whole purse. And it's yeah, like a winner take that. all thing. And, and, you know, Ryan Garcia was like, write a contract up. And I was like, oh, you're dead. You're like legal serious about this shit. This is not just a, 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 a Instagram handshake. This is like, you want to put it on. They're paper. trying. That's such yeah. a terrible idea. Like, I get it. <laughs> it is. Like, I get it. You know what I mean? It's, it's cool promotion and, and, you know, Tank, I don't know if you guys saw the video of, of that whole interaction and Tank Dev, Davis having like his little Twitch hype man behind him and whatever the hell I, was going there. God, get that guy out of there. That guy made me so... You know that like I, I'm picking Javante Davis to win this fight, but you know, I mean, let alone not Ryan Garcia, but the, the guys on the undercard of this fucking thing will starch that man <laughs> in a hot second. You know what I mean? On the street, whatever you bring a night. I mean, they're just they're fucking your world up. Yeah. So I don't like having guys like that in the video. He's not even a fighter for fuck's sake. I don't. I'm not a huge fan of hype men, especially when it comes to a fight. Like 
Dude is going in there to fight a man one on one. He doesn't need you to like hold his dick for him. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. He doesn't. He, he can take like especially Tank. Tank is not a guy who doesn't say nothing. Yeah. Tank can talk his yeah. shit. He doesn't need your help. Um, yeah. But it's it's been great promotion, man. I've been really enjoying it. I, I'm going with Garcia on this one. I know I'm probably in the minority. Oh, oh, oh this is gonna be fun podcast. Let's go. I, Let's. I, this is gonna be a fun. Podcast. I know I'm in the minority here, man. And I know a lot of people think that Brian Garcia is a one trick pony. That <laughs> all he's got is the left hook. And, you know, I think a lot of people think that all he has is left hook because that's all he's really needed. That left hook is fucking ridiculous. The fact that yeah, he's even able to move a part of his body that fast is ridiculous, let alone the thing he attacks people with. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And, and also, for the record, he doesn't just have a left hook. It's 100%. only just his best weapon, yeah. and that's a go-to thing to say about him. Uh, the, the right hook's there as well. Yep. If you've seen some of the training videos, the way he's hitting that aqua bag is a little bit scary. Yeah. It's a little scary. Dude, like he had some of the craziest hand speed I have ever seen. I mean, this is saying a very yeah. obvious point, but like, it is, it's mind-blowing. The thing I like about Garcia, too, and, and frankly, Tank does this pretty well as well, I feel like Tank is a little bit more uh, sneaky with his shit, right? Like, he sets yes. things up in a very sneaky way. He's laying traps, and a lot of times you don't even realize he's laying traps. Um, and then he ends up he ends up messing people up. But but Garcia has length to him, and I think Garcia has been the, the kind of fighter that is able to extend a lot of his punches without being out of, out of balance and out of range and overcommitting to those punches. Um, and he uses a lot of that range, too, to set up that left hook. Um, and like I said, I don't think the only thing he has is left hook. I do think that, that is something that people use when they like to argue about why Ryan Garcia might not be that good or if they want to hate on Ryan Garcia. Ryan Garcia is a monster, dude. That dude puts combinations together like nobody's business. But again, he hasn't had to use anything other than a left hook. The left hook works. Why would he change up his entire game plan or his entire approach to a fight if nobody's forcing him to do that? But I think Tank will. Yeah, no, he will. But here's the real question, too, Omar. Like, I am fully on board, actually, with what everything you just said there. But I think that there's a question mark about exactly your point there. It's not maybe as much like that's all he's needed, so why would he need to show more? As much as if that's all we've seen, does he – like I said, he has more than just a left hook. Like, his right hook's good. We've seen that, though. But does he actually have – like, he doesn't use a lot of head movement. He sure. doesn't have a lot of footwork. Um, he doesn't cut angles. Does he have to? He usually walks people down because he can. can does he have the other things? Like, is, it's not just necessarily like, you know, he hasn't needed to show them. Does he have them? Because like to your same point, if you've never needed them, um, given what kind of camp you're in now, he's got he's under Joe Goosen now, who's a hell of a trainer. That's a Hall of Fame trainer right there, uh, who pulled off, who who grabbed his fighter Diego Corrales in one of the greatest comeback victories in boxing of all time. That's a Hall of Fame trainer, but he's new to him. He's only had the Fortuna fight under him, and now this will be his second one. So before that, was he in there with, he said, you know, about his camps that he had left there because of Eddie Reynoso paying a lot of attention to Canelo. Then he has other fighters as well. Uh, Eddie Reynoso also has like Oscar Valdez in there and stuff. So it was just a little bit like he couldn't get the time he needed. So did he actually learn these things? And even with Joe Goosen, who's great, he's only had one fight under him. Um, he has had a little bit of time because he's he's had time off, um, but yeah, I here here's my thing. Like you again to your point, you said it perfectly already. Is that his tank is tricky, right? And he sets things up. He has so that's to my point is everybody speaks of him as the power puncher, but he's I mean just because he punches with power, he has got incredible incredible boxing iq yeah. he he yeah and that's very underrated for him people don't really talk about that that much that the guy was trained you know for the longest time by floyd mayweather you, you if he, and and when you think of a power puncher and that all of it almost dude he has all of his fights i don't have his record in front of me but he is he has something 
absolutely insane, like a 95, I believe, 96% KO ratio. So yep. when you think, when if you're told that, you imagine a guy stalking, walking someone down, cold clocking him. He doesn't, man. He conserves himself. He does. Not, he's a notoriously slow starter, as a matter of fact. He doesn't throw a lot of punches, and he waits to set that thing up, dude. He waits to set up that clean, clean counter. Um, and and I, I like the better boxing, but you're not alone in this, uh, Omar. I just I just disagree with it. That I I, I think Tank will win this fight um, by KO, and I think it'll happen late. I think that it'll happen rounds eight or nine is my prediction. And uh, if you guys want a good gambling pick, oh, uh, uh, you know, throw the mortgage on this, right, Omar? Like the last one. We did. We pulled it off. Yeah, just like the last one. We pulled that one off, though. But uh, there's, a good, there's a good pick where, because Tank's a favorite. They're close odds. I believe he's a minus 250. I don't know if you can pull up the odds, but he's yeah, something try. around there. But if you bet, if you bet... Uh, um, on the on the on the special on the round, round by round, not exact round, but there's a bet in there that is uh, from round yep. s- uh, t- tank TKO round seven to twelve, uh, and that's only like a minus one ten, I think, on DraftKings or something like that. I pulled that one up, wow. and a couple other undercard, uh, two other undercards that are sure things to parlay to get you like a plus one twenty five. Uh, that's going to be my bet for the weekend. But yeah, you're right. Tank KO is, rounds tank is about minus two fifty for the uh for the overall. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then and there's yeah, you're, a you're, there's you're, a bet there from seven, rounds you're finished. Seven to twelve, he's plus one ten. There you go. Plus one ten for the finish by for through seven to twelve. And let me and tell you something. Decision. He's a favorite. Huh? That includes decision as well. That includes decision as well. But here's the thing is that so if fuck the decision though. You know, the thing is is if he went, he's a favorite, right? Yep. He's a, he's a not bo- boxing odds. These are close, but like you put these in like you, he's a, he's a, he's favored to win this fight for sure. Right. Yep. And here's the thing. How would he win? You guys like, if he does win, right. Oh my, how's he going to win it? This will be a stoppage. Yeah? yeah. I would imagine. Yeah. And, and he's, and it's not going to, and he's a notoriously slow starter. So he's not going to come out there and just brutalize. I, I, as a matter of fact, think that this fight plays out actually beautifully in the sense that I think that Ryan Garcia, who is not a slow starter and with very fast hands, Tank has good D. De- I think that he picks a lot of these early rounds up, a lot of them. And I think if you don't have a... If you're, this is on two platforms, by the way, DAZN and Showtime. So if you're not watching it on the DAZN platform and getting an unofficial scorecard from Chris Mannix, God bless him, then we'll have somebody in there that can do these things. I think you throw up an unofficial scorecard that has Ryan Garcia uh, ahead about halfway through the fight, five rounds to one, something like that, and everybody says, wow, look at this, and then Tank gets him out of there late, and then everybody can say, well, Ryan made a really good showing of himself and was not, it wasn't even that clear. He was way up on the scorecards, um, and he'll be, I think that's the way this whole fight plays out. So I, and I think that's a plus 110, dude. If he wins and he's favored to win, that's the way he wins, dude, between rounds 7 and 12 by stoppage. So you kind of just answered a question that I wanted to ask, which is that I know Tank carries so much power and it's in all all his shots it's not like it's just in his overhand right or whatever like he carries it in every shot he throws and he knows how much success he's had in setting guys up and not having to rush it and walk guys down so i was what i was going to ask was do you have any concern that he ends up falling too far behind because of his patience and willingness to kind of drop rounds and be passive in stretches but it sounds like you're not too concerned about it because you just trust that he'll be able to find it in in the later rounds. So I do trust, like, because I gave you the pick there, I do trust that. I'm betting on it personally. I, I, I think that's what happens. But, yeah, dude, that's a, that's a hell of a point. Because if Ryan Garcia wins this fight, dude, even if he drops him or something, Tank will get, like, he's not going to finish Tank. That won't happen. But if this goes to decision, let's put it this way. If this goes to decision, I definitely I definitely favor Ryan Garcia in that way. Because there's a lot of tank fights we can look back to. I mean, he had a very close fight 
um, that went all the way when he wasn't able to stop a guy with uh, Isak Cruz. Very close fight where it went all the way. Leo Santa Cruz was way up on the scorecards at the time of the stoppage. You know, there's a lot of things to go back to in his career where guys give him... But it's, you know, it's weird. He's got great defense, man. I don't want to say they give him problems. It's all intentional on his side. Who's more hittable of the two? Oh, Uh, man. I mean, definitely. I mean, yeah, even Omar, you have to agree with that. Yeah, I know he gets caught I mean, standing straight up sometimes, Garcia. Let's be real. Right? If we're talking about, especially yeah. when you're talking about, like, whose chin is up in the air more, Ryan Garcia's got a bad habit yeah. of that shit. Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean yeah. when I say caught standing straight up. And the left hand is very fast. And like I said, I don't just say he's only got it. He's got a right hand as well. But when he throws it, when he throws it, it's not a hook that's nice in tight like this. It's a looping. It's a looping from out here, but he's just very fast, so he gets away with it. But it loops from out here. A lot of times, he'll he'll jump into it as well and keep both hands down. Uh, and 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 Tank is a counter puncher, man, through and through. Yeah, Brian actually the way he throws that left hook, I actually really love it. And he'll rotate his body before he actually to- rotates the, the the shoulder to come with it. So you'll see him almost completely pivoted over by the time that hook. Is coming I can through picture just, that as you're saying it. Him dude, throwing it wrecks it. Yeah. It wrecks people, man. It's, it's, and he does it, and like, like like Tommy said, he does it so fast, you don't even really notice it. But the man pivots yeah. so hard on that hook, it's crazy. How much faster yeah. is and, Tank than the previous opponents of Ryan Garcia? Like, I know he always has that speed advantage. Is it is it nullified a lot more by Tank than his than it was in his prior fights? He doesn't always have all, always a speed advantage. Like, Leo Santa Cruz lit him up and won a lot of rounds with hand speed, basically. With hand speed and combinations. And that's the reason why I think that Ryan Garcia takes a lot of rounds away from him uh, well, yeah, when I, he's not being I, I, super active. I was saying Garcia always has the speed, speed advantage in his prior fights. So I was saying... Okay. I, I was saying how, how much closer is tank speed to Garcia's where maybe he loses some of the advantage he usually has. Well, he's fast with that one shot. He's they're different fighters because Garcia's hand speed, like we're talking about that left that one left hook that's great and fast and and very powerful. But also, I mean, his he, his jab, everything that Garcia throws, his hand speed in general is fast and he can put it together in combination punching. But with uh Gervonta Davis, I wouldn't like I mean these guys are small. This is the lightweight division. This is a catch weight by the way. Right, it was right. 136. But 135 is a light pound lightweight uh division. And the, all these guys are pretty fast. But as far as they go out of fast guys, you know, Tank doesn't like Tank can throw combinations well, but he's not like all hand speed kind right. of thing. The thing that he does and part of the whole thing of him you like he works I say this all the time, my pie. You gotta, you gotta take what you do well, and you, you, you gotta learn some other things. But you always gotta build your whole game around what you do well, you know. And so uh, that's what Tank does. So he kind of knows, I think, that like, eh, I can put my punch together, but I'm not gonna be the fastest guy all the time. But I got, I can, I can give him one good quick one, and I got really great eyes. I got really great eyes for and defense for what's coming my way. And if I can slip one and give them one quick one, it's going to be very powerful. And I can put that one shot together fast. So that's why it leans into combination punching, you know, more than just like hand speed to put shots together real fast. Yeah. Makes sense. Davis is, I think, a lot better, too, when it comes to the footwork. He's, his ability to close distance without you even knowing he's closing distance, I think, is something you don't really see in, in high-level boxing, I think, as much anymore. Yes, yes. And he's going to look to put that foot on the outside as well, on the outside of Ryan Garcia. Um, and, and things like, little things like that are, are, are of, of, of good boxing fundamentals are, are not exactly things that we've had to see yet from Ryan Garcia. And the thing, just the thing is like, I'm not, a, I'm not a hater of him at all. I think this fight, part of the reason it's so great and, and the buildup is so great is that, you know, there's a lot of like you're the fans of one guy or fans of the other and they go after it. But 
I mean, I'm just a boxing fan, so I, 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 lo I love both guys. I'm just picking the guy I think is going to win here. But, yeah, Ryan Garcia is really great. But he, I think, I mean, one, he's the younger guy. Also, if you look, this is always important to me. It's not important to some people, but resume, even in MMA, dude, like, yeah. and, and that's not, you know, my thing is the box. But even with them, all of it resume that's what's important to me unless a guy's 40 years old and you can just go oh look he got you know he's old now and he's so in general in combat sports who have you fought um even if you lost did you do well but especially your wins on your resume who are those people and and who has fought the better competition because that is always what's going to push you to learn more things and give you more experience in general. So if a guy, let's say, has a hundred fights even, but they but he's only fought two good people versus a guy that's only had eighteen fights and he's already fought six great guys, I'm probably going with that with that guy with less fights that's fought better competition and pulled out wins from there or had great performances even in a loss like that. But both these guys are fucking undefeated, man. And they're both young, and I really just want this to uh, promote boxing, man. We've had we've had good stuff. Like I said, the ben, the Benavides thing. We we man, we had uh, what was the one the the Brian Mendoza win over over Sebastian Fondora was absolutely fantastic, dude. Last Saturday there was a fight on that was supposed to be kind of shit. Like they're cool fighters, but uh, Zili Z Zhang, Big Bang Zhang from Ch the China Power. He's our, uh, yeah, he's <laughs> pulling out a fucking huge underdog win against Joe Joyce. They, dude, underdogs are, t are taking over in, in this sport as well, again, finally, because they're giving better matchups, right. but it's just slow. So, like, even this that fight was, like, them trying to, let's give some better matchups, and it didn't catch attention and things like that, but... This is them, like, not putting... Dude, in years past, you used to be able to gamble on a sport and parlay, like, 12 heavy favorites. I used to do it all the time. Um, and they were, like, almost, dude, guaranteed to win. You parlay, like, 12 different, 10 different, you know, uh, minus 1,000 favorites and get some money out. It was almost guaranteed. Not anymore. That shit is not safe anymore. They're, they're, they're putting together better matchups. I love that. That's what they need to be doing. Yes. Let me ask you one last question I want to ask about, about this particular matchup. Say this thing deteriorates as it goes on, starts to get a little uglier. Maybe, maybe Tank got a little hurt early, and then he hurt Garcia a little as the fight went on, and we're in like later rounds. Who is more of a dog? Who do you trust more to, to gut through being a little hurt and they, it getting a little ugly and, and pull it out if that's what it starts to look like? Well... I want to fr tank, but I, again, that's because we've actually seen that with him. You know, Isak Cruz absolutely pushed him to the limit, did not go away, uh, fight went all the way, was an absolute dog in there. Um, we've seen that with him, and so that's kind of what I talked about. What what have we seen? What has their resumes showed us? Like, Ryan has not needed to show that, right? but I will tell you that um, the one thing, if you're a Ryan Garcia fan, that should give you some hope here is that all fighters, they might talk some trash. Like like Omar said, these guys have had some great trash talk back and forth that's, that's enjoyable. But one thing else to know about this fight that I do want to give like a lot of credit to Ryan Garcia is it's credit to both men that they accepted this fight. Um, but Ryan Garcia made this fight. you know, And it took Gervonta Davis to sign the contract. But Ryan Garcia is the kid that's young. People say, well, I mean, you are not supposed to move uh, in this kind of speed to the best test of the division. You know what I mean? Um, but he called him out years ago when people forgot about He called him out again. He came back after a long layoff with the mental health stuff. He had a good win, called him out again. He said, I'll whoop his ass in front of everybody. And Oscar De La Hoya runs Golden Boy Promotions, which is the smallest boxing promotion out of all of them. Very hands down. It's not even close. Not even close. And he used to have Canelo. He lost Canelo years ago to Eddie Hearn. Um, all he has is Ryan Garcia. And I fucking guarantee you, dude, I really, like, there is no one's going to tell me I'm wrong. Because if you don't know or I don't, I guarantee you that Oscar De La Hoya was like, no, no. 
no, don't do that. Don't do it. And he probably literally told them because he can kind of call shots with them because he's handedly their biggest cash cow. Um, probably told him, no, fuck that. I want this fight. And you know why you can see that? Because of the way the contract worked as well. It was like, well, let's, you yeah. know, uh, Oscar put his foot down and was like, we want dual, you know, you're going to give us dual promotion. Like if we make this at last minute, he's like, we will run this on the zone and showtime. Right, at least, right? Give me that. But he he faulted to taking way less money. Definitely not even close to a 50-50 split here on the money. Um, and he also there's a rehydration that's clause that's in that, effect yeah. for Ryan that's Garcia. That. Yeah, yeah, and that that's a big deal, man, yeah. because you have the weigh-ins. But the rehydration clause, basically, for those that that don't know that might be listening, tells you that you got to weigh in the same at, at the at the catch weight that this you know at the weight like every other fighter. But then after you weigh in, there's only so much pounds that you can even put back on when your body is just desperate. Like I'm fucking dying. Let me drink some water. Let me get some food in me. And then there's only so much weight you can put back on. So he's not allowing them to be as big. And rehydration clauses are actually very rare. They're very rare. So that tells you something also about how serious, you know, Tank does take Ryan Garcia. He's If you think, oh, just because Ryan Garcia is the bigger man, again, look at the resumes here. We saw Tank Davis fight Mario Barrios up at 140. And Barrios, dude, has moved up in weight to 147. Barrios was always a big 140. That's the biggest 140 pounder you can find. There was no rehydration clause. Tank was like, yeah, just give me this. I'll make quick work of this guy. But he takes Ryan Garcia serious enough to to say, yeah, I fought bigger men before and didn't care, but... Hey, I want a rehydration clause on your ass, you know. That's a good point. And he, and he accepted that. He accepted that as well. So he went out of his way to to get this fight. You got to respect that. Yeah. yeah. Sounds like he was, Gervonta was probably putting up a lot of roadblocks, whether to make an excuse or not, or, or, or kind of a way out. And Garcia, it sounds like just wasn't having it. It just wasn't going to give him the leeway to give him any reason to say, no, he didn't want this fight. He didn't want to take this fight. And. So I, I give Garcia well, credit, and man. Absolutely. And, I, I mean, I don't feel comfortable saying, like, it's all Tank Davis. Because, I mean, you guys know how this way. They got yeah, management yeah, yeah, teams yeah, and all sure. these things. I just am saying that I think that in Ryan Garcia's case, who has his own coach, his own management, his own promoter, he's under all that, was, like, fighting with everybody to be like, I don't care. We'll take less money. We'll take this. Re- I just want the fight. Get this guy to, to get me this fight. Yep. Whereas Tank was just kind of like, I don't really need this fight. You know, I'm already, like, selling out pay-per-views left and right. Garcia has not done one. You know, right. this is his first one. Tank's, like, seven straight of selling out play. So he was probably just more along the lines in general of, like, I'll take the fight, but I don't really need it, so it's whatever, you know, if it falls apart. And probably just let his own management team and, uh, you know, Leonard Ellerby and stuff throw things in the contract that they were basically going to say, we're going to fucking just steal from you <laughs> if you really want this fight. And then Garcia was like, fuck it. Yeah, all I do is want this fight. <laughs> yeah, I like that. That's an interesting angle. Um, yeah. All right. Well, let, let's get some final picks here. It's getting late on our end. So I know okay. you're, you're going. You're going. Nobody's out. watching this too. I appreciate the prime time, but it's good that you clip them, Omar. You know what I'm saying? So maybe we can get some some people on the boxing here. But yeah, you guys are like what an hour and a half in or something, dude. Bro, more we're than almost that. three hours. We're, we're two and a half. Hey, in. what's your yeah. what's your what's your average view duration? I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I couldn't even tell you. You don't want to answer. I, I, I was actually curious. Maybe tell me off the thing. I was curious because I was wondering, like, dude, I've been getting a lot of better views on my channel, but I try to keep this stuff short and condensed. Um, but, you know, so it's, it's like if I only do a 10-minute video, I figure, yeah, keep it. But it's still, like, going to be, like, only three minutes of – but I wonder if you do them longer, if it translates. And it's like, yeah, our thing's two hours, but we got 20 minutes of watch time in there. You know, know. We would cool. have to look. I really don't know off the top yeah. of my Hey, head. Mark, that is a great – before you ask your question, what a fantastic who, – hey, who drew that picture behind <laughs> you of the show? That's fucking awesome. Look at that. Art. Look at that fucking Art thing. by Tommy O'Neill. Oh my goodness! You got to be kidding me! Boxing. You can Look see how that. long the yes. was. Paul was... Craig chilling over here. 
Yeah, look at dude, Omar has come a long way. Always good takes on the show. I love you, Omar. You've come a long way. I remember I told my friends, you gotta subscribe to this thing. And some of the people, anybody that listen to me, man, my cousin, they're doing this show. And they're like, I actually really everybody was like, I really like the show. But what is up with like the dude that has like he's just letting his hair like just do whatever the fuck it may. You know, on the first episode, it was just like Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, no, dude, that's the evolution of my. Oh, uh, that first step, I it it had to be intentional. Yes, Omar, like the hair just sitting out there like this had to be like I want to piss people off <laughs> who look at me. <laughs> uh, all right, uh, let's circle this thing back in. So you are going tank knockout. Give us a round for the hell of it. Okay, so can I tell you the round? Then I give you my 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 bets. I'm actually doing here though. Yes, you may. Okay, if I have to pick a round. It's round eight. Okay. It's in my head. Yep. Tank KO round eight. Uh, Damn. Now let me give you my, now let me give you the, 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 what I'm doing. If you guys want to, if you guys aren't unboxing subscribers yet, we're giving good fucking picks on here. Okay. I really, daddy really makes up for the money on this. Uh, <laughs> but we're, we're going, we're on the undercard of this, of this uh, main event here on the undercard. We got David Morrell, who is an absolute savage. Now, he's a minus 2,000 favorite, so it's going to do you no good to bet a straight win for him. So you're going to want to go uh, minus 800 on the fight, not going the distance for the David Morrell fight. Uh, and then, unfortunately, because I'm a huge fucking fan of this guy, a huge fan of this guy, God bless Gabriel Rosado, the Puerto Rican Rocky, but yes, he is too old to be fighting. I love that guy more than anybody. Fuck all you guys out there. I love him more than anybody, <laughs> but he should retire. He should retire. He should retire. And he pulled off one of his most incredible underdog wins, beating Beck the Bully, Beck Demir Melikuziev. And for some reason, they're like, you know what? Gabe Rosado has lost his last three. Let's put him up against this fucking kid again <laughs> and see if he can pull one trick out the hat. And he's not going to be able to, you guys. So you're going to want to bet Bektomir Melikuziev. Um, but, but I will say, bet him straight. Add that on your parlay because Gabe Rosado's a fucking dog. And he's going to lose this fight, unfortunately. But I, I wouldn't be surprised if he makes it all the way with all his veteran savvy in there. And then you parlay those two picks with the Tank Davis KO slash TKO slash DQ between round 7 and 12, and that is going to give you about a plus 150, plus 170 on your money. I like it. I like it very much. It's my, my style of bet. Right Do you now. like this hat before we I, get almost? So I meant to say it before, and then I my mind went, but yes, respect. Yes. I love the fucking okay. hat. They Thank sucked you. last night. But... <laughs> Dude, I don't even know what happened. I watched the first quarter. It was, like, tied at the end of the first. I go put my kids to bed, which is a process. So by the time I got back down, it was halftime. And they're down by, like, 22. I was like, what the fuck just happened in, in one quarter? But whatever. Anyway. We're still in there, back. baby. We're I, still oh, we're, yeah. we're all right. All we had to do was steal one in Cleveland. We did it. It's 1-1. Yep. Now we're coming back to New York. There we go. Um, the pick, I am in a similar boat, though, with obviously a lot less knowledge to back it up. But I am going to go. I'm going to say tank uh, round nine knockout. So to Omar. You're doing right? the Jeopardy thing where it's like the guy looks over like, yeah, let's do. Uh, yeah, I had a real wheel. Before you you're like, let's here. do 100. And then you're the guy to the right that goes, let's go 101. And you look over. I'm like, you son of a I, bitch. I had it written down before you even came on here. That's what I was okay. going with. It All just right, so happened enough. to be right next to yours. Fair enough. Um, so, Omar, I know you're going Garcia. Decision, or are you taking him to get a finish? I'm taking him to get a finish. Wow. I'm oh, also... Jesus, Omar. God. I, it's why I don't bet, because your boy is fucking, it's too emotional for this shit. <laughs> I'm too emotional for this shit. Uh, I love it. I'm going to go to finish here. I'm going to also go round eight. Wow. Love it, love it. Wow, okay, I like this. All right, now listen, before we go here, you guys, I'm going to commandeer this fucking show, okay? <laughs> listen, if, if we could get on here and you guys could talk boxing with me, you need to stick me in here when Mike has his next baby so so I can take my uh, casual-ass takes on the MMA level, okay? 
All right. I think Lindsay's right. done, bro. I think Lindsay closed that. the factory. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's fair enough. I think she's done. Uh, yes, we should get you on here for a big MMA at one point. That's it. All right. Awesome. Thank you, dude, for coming on. Um, Thank you, guys. Good to see you guys will, again. We will post this on ours. We'll also send the clip over to Tommy so it'll be posted on his channel. Check out all the rest of his posts. He's already got a whole thing up on, on the Garcia Tank fight where he probably says some things that you didn't hear today, so it's worth watching both. And, uh, yeah, we'll see you at the next big fight, I guess. Will do, buddy. Thank you, guys. All, all right. Guys. Omar, all we're right. out of here too, right? Should we all sign off at this point? Let's all sign we don't need any off. Fucking trivia. Just click out, out, right? Just just hit the old X. All yes. right. Peace. Peace.